Today is January 4th, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Let's talk about evolution. It's actually been quite a while since we've talked about evolution. So uh, we're going to talk about that for a little bit, you know, see what primordial bat we came out of today. Social workers versus cops. Remember that when the news when they wanted to send social workers for domestic abuse and things like that? And everyone's like, no, they're going to get shot. Well, we have a social worker, so let's talk to them and see how they feel about it. Then we're met with some black Hebrew Israelite rage. Then we're met with some Muslim rage. So just rage all around by people that want to be perceived as peaceful. Um, wish you all could see the chat, which is one more reason you should join us live on clubhouse.com slash askachristian. So you can read all the fun comments they make. Uh, <laughs> they rage out. So that's what we're going to talk about. And then Dr. Joshua Bowen joins us and uh, chats a little bit about some of his books and upcoming work and, uh, you know, problems with Christianity he sees and radical Christianity. So we, uh, we're going to end the discussion with a little bit of that. It's good and certainly more peaceful than the other stuff. So enjoy your day. Find us wherever podcasts can be found. Um, there was a, a rab scuttle uh, was, uh, was talking in a room with uh, a guy named T who's a, a Muslim. And uh, uh, T actually, w one of the questions was, and he, what he he was asking Rabs to answer was, if if your if your mother created you and gave you life, why is it that when you die, she can't do it again? <laughs> I I I kid you not. And and Rabs had the the best answer. I mean, it's it's a sad and unfortunate answer. It would have been the same answer I gave him. Like, well, my my mother's dead, so she <laughs> couldn't. Like, if if I died, she's already gone. How could she possibly? And it it was like it it was the proverbial trying to talk to a wall. Wow. It was uh, yeah. Like I I was gobsmacked at that question. Like, yeah. Totally gobsmacked at that question. There, so many of them go that way. I mean, do you do you see anything from from your outside looking in perspective? Because although you're not religious, we still you know point in the same kitty litter box. Um, I, it just seems like there's little of value, right? Like the number one point for Christianity is you know centered around like you know Jesus, right? For Christianity, for yeah. Muslims, it would be centered around you know whatever they think, like the five pillars of Islam or the thing that makes you a Muslim or, you know, like their, their central point. And for atheists, whatever you guys central point is that you'd like to make. But it seems like a small percentage of time is dedicated to what each group actually considers the main things that they, they would like to push. Um, and the overwhelming percentage of, t of time is spent just in BS, <laughs> just out in far left field that no one really cares about. It's just kind of like wasting time for everyone. I think sometimes it, it, one, of, one of the things that I find interesting is 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 the the, the myriad. Uh, this this will sound like a, an odd statement. One of the things that I find interesting is what some people find interesting. Uh, you, you know, so like I, I think I think you and I are close to the same mindset where we would kind of tune in to the same types of things that we may find interesting and also tune out at the same points where like this is no longer interesting to me um and and those the but it's it's those things the things that people do still find interesting and seem to have no no end of energy to uh to invest in and discuss that i i find that intriguing like how is it that so one of the other things that was being argued about was uh, was evolution, right? And I've met lots of theistic evolutionists, right? People who believe that, you know, uh, that, you know, evolution is a thing, you know, that Darwin was essentially correct, but that it was God that kind of sparked life and then allowed evolution to kind of go as it as it is. And that's why, and then they would use it as an explanation. That's why we see the evidence that we see. God's responsible, but 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 the mechanism he he chose to use was evolution through natural selection. This explains the biodiversity. This this explains why, you know, you only find marsupials in one part of the world. This explains why you only find, uh, you know, penguins, you know, in the South Pole. This explains, you know, A B C X Y Z. Um, and yet during during the same discussion, half an hour ish ago, 
one of the guys was like, well, you know, th theory, you know, like the theory of evolution. It, it, and he said, it's, it's right in the name. It's only a theory. It's not a fact. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, you don't, you don't even understand how the word theory is used in modern scientific discourse. And this is one of, one of the things I said, I said, I said, we know more about evolution than we know about gravity. Like we still don't understand how, like we don't understand the mechanism of how you know, like supermassive gravity can actually bend time. We don't understand that yet, but we understand, you know, the phylogeny between, you know, a animal and B animal almost, almost completely. We haven't worked out a, and, and then the, also the, the weird misunderstanding of how people don't understand the difference between abiogenesis and evolution, right? Cause you can't, you know, it's like, Oh, how did we, how did we evolve? How did we evolve from nothing? That's not how that works. <laughs> you have to have life first and we haven't got that worked out yet. So, yeah. Anyway. And for the, yeah. And on one hand, th there's just so much to it that can for the for foreseeable ever be proven. So not, not, talking about the evolution stuff, but like talking about like theistic evolution, right? How they're like, well, you know, evolution's cool, but God sparked it. Great. People have hard enough time trying to make the case for just regular old non-theistic evolution. So now, okay, God did it. Sure. I guess you'll, that'll just be your opinion. And on one hand, it's like, well, do they, do they just try to, to hedge and they're just trying to play in both worlds and be like, well, you know, evolution is great, but God did it. So, you know, I'm, I'm good on all sides. Um, or are they, they re are they saying it for like an easy conversation to like get out of a sticky spot or are they saying, um, you know, are they doing it because they sincerely believe it? I'm sure there's some of each. And then it's like, oh, well, you know, if God did that just as easy, you could flip it around. And this is all unprovable stuff and be like, oh, well, you know, evolution of science understands it is signs from demons to trick them, to lead them astray. And it's a test that many are failing. Um, so sure. Add that to the mix. There's no way to prove what's true or not in that regard. Um, so that, that's why I, I wholly just kind of loathe the whole discussion about it. Cause I mean, if we're, if people are trying to make the case for just evolution and then you try to add like some sort of theistic quandary to it, good luck. That's a great way to spend, uh, you know, a lot of time going nowhere. Yeah, because it, it, it seems to be, and this is one of the, this has been one of the sticking points for me, uh, is that, and and these these aren't my words exactly, but I, I don't remember who it is that said this, but I agree with the following statement. God has no explanatory power. Saying God did it in no way explains how God did it. it it's just using God as a place marker for something we don't quite know yet. And so and and so for the person who who argues theistic evolution, they say, well, yeah, yeah, but you know, we don't know yet, but we know God. You know, we know God did it. I believe God did it. He he started this. He sparked it. Well, how? Uh, because he's God. Because he can do whatever he wants. Isn't it, you know? It doesn't seem to me to be an explanation. Well, I mean, it's not going to win you a word, but I mean, on some level, it's no different than you know before we have a concept of you know like evolution, right? Before people had had the theories they do have today. Um, when they when it was just an idea, and they're like, okay, we think this could have happened. How do we think this could have happened? And when they got like step one, which is like, we think maybe this. I mean, that's essentially like starting with, uh, well, we believe God did it, but how? It could have been, and then, you know, insert assertion. So, I mean, uh, really, you could say on some level, it's no different. It's just that, you know, people have fleshed out a lot more of what they feel like evolution you know, is now today that's become the theory of evolution and people who say God did it are, you know, still back at, you know, steps behind them. So, I mean, it doesn't make it wrong. And yeah, right now it's not a great explanation, but maybe one day, I don't know, someone will have some revelation or something be like, oh, you know what? This is how, and this is how, maybe that will give us an abiogenesis event that, you know, the wider world, the non-religious world would subscribe to. And then they'll be able to better connect the dots between abiogenesis and, you know, maybe maybe there's some missing step. It seems unlikely now between abiogenesis and evolution, but maybe there's a missing step or two. And they're like, oh, now we know they, they're, of course, they're different, but you can just see how it's so hand in glove united. And, you know, praise be to God. Just yeah. saying. Seems yeah. fanciful, but. Yeah, I mean, what, what you put forth, uh, you know, and I think what you put forward is that hypothesis is, you know, 
probably probably impossible to disprove. Um, and, and and but what's interesting for me is that is that the the it seems to me that the person who's religious seems more content. And and I think I I think there are some theists that I have to exclude because I have met a good number of honest theists who are willing to use the following words. I don't know. Um, and those are three words that I appreciate a great deal because it's the most honest thing you can say sometimes, especially when you don't know. And, and so I, I think that that's a totally fair thing to say. There are some theists who will say, you know, I, and, and I think I may have even heard you say this, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, but hopefully, you know, I get to ask God someday. I think I've heard you say almost those exact words. And I appreciate that. Right. It, it seems to me to be much more um, curious for the person who said, well, no, oh, no, I just I have all the answers already. And they seem to have an answer for everything. And they they never seem to be able to let those three words escape their mouth. Well, yeah, I mean, fair point. Um, you know, and no one no one escapes it. Right. So it's that's just like people who, you know, uh, quote, speak for science, but don't have an understanding of what that means, how, you know, science, uh, you know, the scientist would assign probabilities, not absolutes. And they're speaking for the science, assigning absolutes left and right, um, you know, from from their non-religious perspective. So, you know, no one escapes it. And I think it's it's pretty easy to spot, um, you know, people who are just saying stuff to get out of a sticky spot because and they really don't know what they're talking about. Versus, like, you know, I don't know. It's not the answer people want to hear, but it's a totally honest and should be accepted answer. Like, you know, uh, the guy uh, yesterday who, who someone was asking about, like, I think Isaiah 21, nine off the top of my head. No, I, I, and we just talked about it yesterday. I don't remember that. So off the top of my head, if you want a deep, uh, Christian answer about Isaiah 21, nine, I think, um, that verse is all I remember. So I'm like, I don't immediately know. I will have to take a little bit and get back to you with an answer. And if it's still so confusing and it's some like deep, mysterious thing of God, I'm like, yeah, man, I don't know. End up on the right side of God and ask him yourself someday. Back to what I was saying earlier. But yeah. And, you know, the, the good thing is we, we, I mean, you know, you know this, but we, we believe the stuff we do absolutely need answers for. We do absolutely have answers for, um, you know, people may not like them, may not, they may not believe them, but, if, you know, if they want to know, Hey, what do Christians actually believe and why do they believe it? This, like, these are the, the main, main things, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, faith in him, repent, believe the gospel. Um, and then, you know, all the corresponding stuff surrounding that. But if they want to ask about, you know, the buoyancy of Noah's Ark, you know, don't really know, don't really care. And this is kind of where you hand wave and say, God did it. So, I mean, it, yes, it, it's kind of like a sidestep. But on the other hand, it's a non-issue because if it, it, you can trace it all the way back to, to the existence of God which we do believe in. And I think there are, you know, reasonably sound arguments for uh, just for rationale, no spiritual stuff attached. And um, so it's like, well, if we believe in a God that can do that, and we believe there's a reasonable reason to believe this God exists, then yeah, people are going to hate it, but you can hand wave away anything else and be like, well, ultimately God is responsible for it. So if God wants it to work, God can make it work. And then, you know, no one's going to get de debate medals, but that's the answer. I mean, if God wants to, you know, uh, do some sign or wonder or miracle, or I don't know, um, explain how or why, um, that would be cool. But if he already explained the ultimate point of the whole religion and following Christ, then there's really no need to explain the buoyancy of a boat or, you know, abiogenesis or beyond, you know, what the Bible says or evolution. Um, so something, I don't know. And that's where you could be like, well, have faith. It's a test of faith. It's demons tricking you, whatever. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about more about how uh, Chris climbed out of the water and grew legs and became the Chris we know and love today. I still, up, Chris? Have, I still have vestigial legs um, <laughs> near my, uh, what was it uh, on the snake, the anal spur? Yep, I was going to say, as, as do my pythons, yes. Pythons, yeah. <laughs> What's up, Jack? I'm mainly, I'm mainly snake. <laughs> How are you doing, Jack? Oh, super, super low. Can't really hear you. Back to you, Chris. 
So, so Michael, would you say like, <clears throat> in terms of evolution, you would display the same humility that you admired in honest theists and just say, kind of throw your hands up and say, I don't know. I think it depends on what, I, I, what, what, uh, what branch of evolution are you, are you talking about? Like, I mean, like, I think we have to go back. So if we go back to, um, I mean, cause I'm not a biologist, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the soft sciences, but if you, if like, we can, we can go back like the, it's commonly referred to as the tree of life, right? Which has been now kind of, there are lots of people who will say that that's, that's not an accurate thing to say. It's more like a bush, right? Cause it's, it's pretty, you know, like it starts out pretty low and then branches out in, you know, a million directions almost right away. Um, so we, we can go back pretty far. We don't know. We do not yet have an explanation for how chemistry became biology. Um, but we're working on it. We, the Royal, we scientists, right. Um, are working on it. And so I think that's, I think the whole thing. I'm just saying like, if, if a theist was to say, if somebody presents a theist with evolution and say, and, and they would say, I don't know. And that's kind of what you're saying is, is that what you're saying would be the respectful, respectable thing? Like for, for, for instance, if I, if you were to ask me like, Hey, did, you know, did Nate crawl out of the water and grow legs? I would be like, I don't know. Would that, would that be what we're talking about right now? Or are we talking about like, Hey, is there such a thing as punctuated equilibrium? I don't know. You know, like what, what are we getting at? Well, no, I mean, and not, not exactly because we, because we do understand the mechanisms of how, um, fish which isn't even a taxonomical term i believe it's actually chordates um we, we do know how chordates became tetrapods right and came out of the water so we actually do know we actually do understand that branch and i'm i'm probably messing up a, a bunch of the words and, and maybe i shouldn't be uh talking about something where my education is um you know as as, as, my, as my as my friend in the audience josh would say this is not my field um <clears throat> But like, we, but there's a lot of it that we, that we do understand. Um, so I guess I'm not, I know I'm not answering your question. Um, so maybe I need a more pointed question. If I, okay. So the theist says, no, chordates did not, you know, transform into, uh, you know, other types of, of amphibians. And you say, yes, they do. Would a would a correct answer for you to to finish the conversation would be, well, we just don't know. Even though you you think that you have very solid evidence to say that we do know, are you saying that the best position as an atheist for you to take on that particular bit of evolution would be, I just don't know. That's what I'm if you were isolating this question to simply me, yes, there would like I would reach the. How about I, a I would PhD reach the, in evolutionary biology? Yeah, absolutely not. No, no, because a, a PhD okay. in, in evolutionary biology could probably take you back to and probably explain in detail how it is there. Like there, there are currently scientific experiments going on where where they have synthesized RNA on clay in laboratories and RNA, like basically one of the, one of the, from a, a paper that I, I perused, mostly perused because I didn't really understand a lot of the language. Um, one of the, I guess the, the most accepted hypothesis right now is the RNA, RNA first world hypothesis where basically where RNA is the precursor to DNA. And ev uh, someone with a PhD in evolutionary biology um, could, could explain all of the mechanisms around the formation of RNA onto that clay, whereas I can't. So uh, the evolutionary biologist, no, he's, he's probably he or she, I, I shouldn't exclude women, shouldn't exclude half the population of the planet. Um, he or she would be able to take you back probably well into the formation of RNA on clay. And then if you ask another question, well, how about that? That's where probably they would say, well, you know that we don't know yet. I don't know. All right, but I guess my, my point being, though, is that it seems like there's a double standard. There seems to be, for the theist, the respectable thing is to say, I don't know. But for the evolutionist, 
I guess, um, for the believer in evolution, it's never respectable to say, I don't know. It's respectable to say, I don't know yet. It's respectable to say the science hasn't come down on that yet, but it's never, it's never respectable to say, well, it could be evolution. It could be something else. Whereas the theist is forced in your paradigm to say, well, it could be creation, but it could be evolution. Do you see the, do you see the problem? Well, it, uh, I see, I see the problem that, and this will sound harsher than I mean it to. I see the problem you're constructing, but I don't see it as a real problem. When I interviewed, um, and not to name drop to him, but when I, when I interviewed Lawrence Krauss on our podcast, um, I, I regret not having the record button on when I asked him this because I said, you know, we were talking just kind of, you know, uh, tongue in cheek about stuff, you know, about stuff that we know. This was just this was right after he um, he had re uh, released the book, uh, The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, which will break your brain. It's on particle physics. Don't waste your time reading it if you don't if you're not into particle physics. My cerebral cortex is still recovering from that exercise. Um, but. Uh, I was asking him about stuff that we, you know, that we can say we know for sure and don't know for sure. And one of the things I said was like, like, we know that a cow can't jump over the moon. And he's like, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that. And I was stopped. I was like, what do you mean we can't say that? And he's like, no, that, that's very unlikely, but we can't say we know that for sure. And I pressed him for about 10 minutes and he would not say, you know, a, a, a professor in theoretical physics would not say, no, it's not, that's not, that's, that's impossible. He would say it's, he said, no, 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 that's incredibly unlikely, but, but it's, but it's not wise for us to say it's impossible. So, so it's, so it's not so much that there's this double standard that you're, um, th that, that you're talking about. I think it also depends on, I think it depends a lot on who, or, you know, who is having these conversations. If you had someone with, you know, PhDs in theology, um, in various fields in uh, philosophy, perhaps, and they were having <laughs> these types of conversations with, uh, or maybe not even that, but maybe if you had someone like uh, Francis Collins, right, who's still a, a Christian, but still, you know, accepts evolution. If, if, he, if he was having a conversation with uh, Richard Dawkins, and, and the two of them were going back and forth uh, about those types of things, people who had um, close to equivalent levels of expertise within given fields, I think those people are more qualified, for lack of a better term, to start to to branch into those areas where they can say, yes, we know these things for sure. No, we don't know these things for sure. Here's where we have to say we don't know. You and I end up saying we don't know long before experts in respective fields say we don't know. I hope that addressed your question. So, so yeah. So, like, one of my favorite films, and I would encourage you to go watch this, it, it's from the 70s, um, and it's called F is for Fake. Okay? Um, it is by Orson Welles, and it is a, it's a very strange amalgamation of documentary and sleight of hand uh, that talks about the quote-unquote experts. Um Here's a great example for you that happened just over New Year's Eve. My friend Bill Adams um, is a PhD in applied mathematics, okay? Like, not ABD or anything. He actually wrote his dissertation. I understood about 30 seconds of him explaining it to me. Um, when he was chatting with one of his fellow professors when he was a college professor, he now works in uh, uh, whatever, financial algorithms, whatever kind of thing. Um but when he was a professor of mathematics, he was talking with the physics guy, and he was he asked the physics guy to explain carbon dating to him, and he was like, "Wait a minute! So wait, you've you've got a magic fairy," and the physics guy got very upset, and he was like, "No, no, no! You have a magic fairy that is keeping the same amount of carbon." in the atmosphere at all times in every eon of history who is your magic fairy and he tried to hand wave it with cosmic waves and like all of these other things and you know back background cosmic radiation and, and you know and and bill just kept pressing the magic fairy and at the end of the day 
what he figured out in order to be able to do the mathematical calculations that prove carbon 14 is that one of his variables had to be magic fairy. And he sticks to that to this day, who is a PhD in mathematics, and he will tell you that scientists are full of crap and that the experts are usually making wild assumptions given their data in order to back up whatever is the pet theory of the day. And I, I hate to, you know, rain on the parade, but I mean, you know, the example that we're going to point to for the foreseeable future is the last two and a half years of everyone's life. How, you know, we find people falsifying data and, you know, doing stuff that is very unethical and scientific, uh, you know, because of any other reasons besides pursuing the science. Um, and that's just unfortunate, but I mean, you know, that is how it is. And now people are like, show me an example, show me an example. Um, you know, they used to say that now they don't say that because they know exactly what everyone's going to say. And, you know, it encompasses like, you know, a worldwide group of, of, you know, scientists. So the entire world is susceptible to this stuff. But I do like the, the uh, point Lawrence Krauss, you were talking about, uh, made Michael, um, how, you know, he, he was unwilling to say a cow couldn't jump over the moon. That's kind of where we go, which Chris is going to hate. But, you know, when people talk about logic and what is logically possible and impossible, it's like, can a squared circle exist? I mean, I just don't want to say absolutely not, because in some, like right now, as we understand it, of course not. But, I mean, in some way, it, you know, no matter how unlikely, uh, you know, that maybe a cow somehow could bend time and space and jump over the moon, um, Maybe in some dimensions, somehow a squared circle can merge, morph, overlap, be the same thing. Uh, anyway, so basically impossible, but just without actually saying that. Anyway, I do appreciate that point. I'm sure Chris will not, but um, <laughs> that's why that's why people were like, I mean, you know, it, it kind of kills discussion, but so much of this stuff does because it's it's opinion based. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I think good. Oh, I think oh yeah, that film uh, F up. is for fake. Oh, yeah, Jamesy, that film F is for fake is my favorite film. And the tagline is, without experts, there can be no fakers. And it's fantastic. Sorry, when did it come out? 1974. 1974, okay. I was three. All right. <laughs> yeah, I know, I was two. But like, yeah, it's my it's one of my favorite films now because it basically so when I was when I was a gallery artist, right, the the whole thing that propelled me to having confidence is that I knew everyone else in the room was just full of crap. And so I could confidently walk up to somebody with a Ph.D. in art history and have a conversation with them. And I knew that everything that they knew and everything every bit uh, every opinion that they had was just was just whatever was popular and if i parroted it whatever was popular and i could have a good narrative about joseph boys and deschamp that i would have that person around my finger and then i could get my art through their filters so Period. okay so end of story it's a manipulation so correct but okay i i don't think that it would be your contention that that there, that there are no experts. That's not your contention, is it? It is. Yes, I think that it, I think that people that have I have an expertise in computers. I'm excellent at what I do. Would I stake, you know, and, and businesses stake their their livelihoods on me? Would I say that I'm an expert? No, but not not by any means. Does this also stand for your friend who's a PhD in math? Yeah, absolutely. And he would say he's not an expert in carbon-14 dating, but some no one has yet to explain the magic fairy to him. Well, and he's talked, to, he's talked to luminaries in physics, and no one can explain why there's not a magic fairy. Because those are the circles he runs in, and he just laughs at them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure, and this is, again, not my area, but I'm not sure whether or not I would listen to a mathematician when it came to radiometric dating. He's not making claims about radiometric dating. He's making claims about assumptions. And what he's making claims about is, please show me where you can hold this as a constant instead of a variable, because he understands constants and variables. And so but the problem is. is, is that there's assumptions that are being made in all sciences. Some of them are very good assumptions. 
Some of them were extremely faulty assumptions. So, and, and in order to make the math, his point is, in order to make the math work where he could actually do the calculations that are apparently very complex calculations, he had to take the variable out because otherwise the calculations wouldn't work. The math didn't work. And so that was his problem. So yes, his expertise in mathematics showed the whole where physicists and scientists are assuming a, a constant when there could be a very uh, after so 10 minutes I get it like, yeah so, so so the easy way to say it oh sorry but yeah so tell me if this is right so the easy way to say it is the guy's math and you know math doesn't lie so he wants to do an equation so he's like all right guys uh, you tell me your stuff I'm ready to write this out and do the equation okay give me all the the numbers and they're like okay Here's some numbers, here's some numbers, here's some numbers. He's like, okay, what about the, the numbers that go here? And they're like, oh, well, it's it's uh, a variable. Or, or he's like, it's a variable. They're like, no, no, it's a constant because we we know this. So this is this is fact. He's like, well, well but it's not because I, I need a constant and I can prove like mathematically it just is not. So give me something that is absolute and I can do the equation. And he keeps asking for something that's absolute and they keep giving him something that they say is absolute, but it's not really absolute, which is why he can't do the equation because although they're claiming it's absolute, it's really not. Otherwise, if it was, he could do the calculation. Is that what you're saying? Right, and he can do the calculation. I think that's what you're saying. Assumes, yeah, he assumes the constant, but he's like he's laughing at them because he's like, so the magic fairy is making your constant for you. I see. I understand. Okay, magic fairy, check. Okay, I think I now have a more clear understanding of what it is that you're saying and why it's total bollocks. Um, okay, so... Um, so when you're talking specific, like about this very specific thing, where you're talking about radiometric dating, the the variable is because of. So we're, if we're talking about, and again, I'm branching uh, so far outside my my field of of knowledge isn't even funny, but um, and anyone who will hear this replay can send me an email to caroger.com and tell me how, <laughs> how tell me how stupid I am. Um, but when we're talking about the variable for carbon dating, right? So we're so we're so we're dating it like we're doing the radiometric dating based on the half-life of the carbon molecule the half-life of the carbon mo molecule has a variable between x and y so when no, they're plugging in the information that's, that's it sounds like that's what you're talking about no you're not that's not what we're talking about the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is one of the variables in order to make carbon dating work and so the variable that they are taking as a constant is the amount of carbon fourteen in the atmosphere at any one time? So the uh, so, so okay, so but we so but we can measure the amount of carbon the in the atmosphere theory. currently. Sure, can you do right. it from two billion years wait. ago? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and assume that there's a constant. Hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. Two Again, this is ago. not my argument. This is my friend with the PhD in applied mathematics that did these okay. calculations. Hold on. You don't use carbon metrics for two billion years ago. That's number one. Reb, is there any way you can turn up your volume? Ago. You've been yeah, super quiet lately. Again, we're not talking. Again, he what he said was, "I will give you carbon dating within two orders of magnitude." That's the way he calculated okay. it out. So it's either if it's forty million, great. If it's forty thousand, great. But that's that's what you get because the math just simply doesn't work. It doesn't in in terms of theoretical mathematics. It's all complete nonsense. Is his hey, point theoretical math? Look, dude, the guy's got a PhD in applied mathematics. I have, I went through Diffie Q. I could not understand the rest of his dissertation explanation after about 20 seconds of him getting into it. So he's wicked smart. His name is Dr. Bill Adams. You can go look him up. You can go ask him these questions yourself. But, you know, here's the thing is that when we're all looking at the same data, there are certain assumptions being made. And this covers all the sciences. We have to make assumptions. We have to make assumptions in economics, for instance, in order for models to work. This is not news to anybody. My no. point is that your assumptions could be incorrect, and your assumptions are based on your philosophical worldview. End of the, Well, wait, so the one clarification here is you're right any one set, which is why they try like eight different ways to figure out things. And as they converge on the same kind of general dates, they have answers. This is why I love you, Rap, because you can explain it better than I can. Right. But again, Rap, like, but 
but they throw out all the other data that doesn't go with their worldview. There was a there was a guy who took some some Kentucky Fried Chicken bones, buried them in the sand, or buried them in his backyard for two weeks, brought them to have them carbon dated, and they came out as forty eight thousand years old. Again, he'll give you an order or two of magnets. <laughs> what 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 was that? Was that a, a stu- what you say? Was that a study or who who did that? Yeah, this is, this is like if you can look it up, man. All this stuff is. What's the name there. of it to it's look up? A, uh, uh, look up Kentucky Fried Chicken Carbon Fourteen Dating. <laughs> but you just said within two orders of magnitude. So the issue is, even within two orders of magnitude, we're talking. You just said forty thousand to forty million, which is older than what the Bible would have said. So I mean, like, even if it's only forty million, well, but again, million, you but again, it. my point. The point is not the actual science. Please get my get my point. My point is not the actual science. The point is the assumptions behind the science. So, so they're all philosophical assumptions. That's my I point. Will, In economics, so let me, let me, we talked, we went through the math. I went through when my economics degree. I, I, I was two classes from graduating, so I never did. I ended up being an entrepreneur. But we went. I went through complex mathematics to prove economic models. But the thing is, is that at the end of the day, it was all based on philosophy because in order for the math to work, I had to hold a bunch of stuff constant and I had to make a bunch of so, assumptions. Let me let me just give my, my rebuttal to all of these statements, though, real fast, is that basically universities, every university in the United States, every university like throughout the, all of the Western world, at the very least, has like every department of physics and anthropology and all these things has grad students in them all desperate to make their mark on the world and to demonstrate that they're the ones that broke the code that figured out whatever and are the ones that want to show that there's a new area and want a new thing named after them that is a driving fact of all the graduate students so you have thousands upon thousands of extremely motivated grad yeah, students this is the nonsense that i hear all the time Rap. looking I, I, for I inconsistencies hear this all the time, but if you go after the philosophical assumptions you will be thrown out of grad school and not true one knows this so Absolutely this is a not red true. hearing i was Absolutely never thrown out of grad true. school i've seen it i, I was worked not. at a university i saw it happen i was at, i got i went through a phd program at a university i never saw it happen so are you dr rap yes Really? I have a PhD in computer science. Undergrads in physics huh. and math. Or physics and computer science. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would just encourage you to go talk to Bill, and maybe you can explain to him the magic fairy in Carbon-14. And and other so, people were unable to. Other physicists no, no. With, phys- phys- with physics PhDs were unable to explain the magic fairy to Dr. Bill. So, so go let find me him. tell you, if I may give you what the constants you're talking about, just so you have better words here. What you're looking at is at any point in the time in the atmosphere, it's not the amount of carbon that matters. What matters is the amount, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. And that's going to be dependent on the amount of solar radiation hitting the upper atmosphere creating carbon-14. The, you are totally right, Chris, that one of the baseline assumptions is that that solar radiation producing carbon-14 is made at a steady rate. That is a constant that is assumed, and that's why they have to go through and calibrate it with tree rings and with, uh, like, ancient and with trying to figure out, like, uh, well depths and, like, eight other things to try to show was it actually consistent. You are totally right that they have to do it, and that's why they have cross-references with, like, five different things for exactly what you're talking about. But it's the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 and the production rate and loss rates in the atmosphere that are usually being disputed. So, like, for example, the chicken bones found on the side of the New Jersey Turnpike are going to have a lot of carbon um, carbon content in them that comes from cars burning fossil fuels where the carbon-14 has all decayed away. So you're going to get them a lot older. That's going to happen through contamination. And there's a lot of effort that goes into showing is there contamination or not. You're right. This is not easy stuff. This isn't stuff an undergrad just does in his lab on a fun day. This is tricky stuff. But it doesn't. But I think saying that experts can't know is being disingenuous. What I'm saying is that experts will hand wave and will cast dispersions on anyone who questions them. And they do this constantly. And we saw it with COVID. We saw actual scientists being banned from media and being absolutely thrown out from doing any work because they were questioning the main assumptions. 
And that is a problem. If we can't admit that that's a problem in the scientific community today, look at global warming. It's the same thing. If we cannot admit that we have a problem with confirmation bias in the sciences, the sciences will continue to have issues and they will eventually they will eventually go into pagan magic which is what we're seeing now with ESG in the sciences and talking about how mathematics is inherently racist etc cetera, etc cetera. there's issues that need to be dealt with by the scientific community and they refuse to do it because they're afraid of the politics i mean as someone I, I, who's not great at math i just want to say you know i'm fine with them calling math racist um, i'm probably the wrong race to say that but i i agree um but what I mean, we can take away or we can like get a little bit away from this conversation. If anyone else would like to say something, we've been at it for a while, unless everyone's just definitely interested in this. But uh, it kind of goes back to what Michael and I were talking about at the beginning. Remember that, Michael, how, how we kind of get off on stuff and, and just keep going. But uh, Rab, if I could real quick uh, make all of your thousands and thousands of dollars for your uh, PhD um, of use right now, I have a question for you. Go for it. Help me upgrade my RAM. <laughs> so I guess that was more of a statement. But... The big trick on uh, memory is going to be making sure it's consistent in the clock speed, right? That's going to be your big one to do. And it's going to be also your motherboard dependent on how much it can actually support in, re in access. So what you'll just want to do is look up what motherboard you have and what the clock speeds are. And then if you're going anywhere above two gigabytes of RAM, which is like everybody, you're going to want to choose ECC RAM because the error rates just get um, unbelievable otherwise. So make sure you choose ECC RAM at the clock speed appropriate for your motherboard and you're good. Yeah, I just like to, before we move on, I would just like to to take a second to kind of slow clap because we are, Rab, Rab's came in and and, uh, and saved me during this conversation. And, and what, it, what it does is it absolutely clearly demonstrates the difference between a scientist and a social worker. Um, and Chris, I, Sure. But, you know, like what you just said, I think is, is indicative of a lot of things around here. Like, you know, how I don't know is a perfectly good answer. And, um, you know, so I, I understand because no one wants to feel like they're put on the spot. Like when someone's like, hey, tell me something about Ezekiel. I'm like, oh, crap. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to need a minute. Uh, and they're like, oh, so you don't know your God. Your God's a lie. Ah, la, 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 la. Um, for example. Um, so, I mean, you know, I don't know should be a fine answer. And the person receiving the I don't know should be like, OK, it doesn't mean they're right or wrong. It just means, you know, they don't know the answer. Like if I gave him five minutes, they'd probably have an answer. Um, anyway, so I would say would say that um, it is like a human thing. But and the last thing about sciencey stuff, uh, which is really not. But Chris, I did look up the how you said you could look on your motherboard to see the different um, kind of like codes, the little dots, and I did, and none of them match. Anyway, just to let you know, I did did do that, but <laughs> apparently I have a stupid motherboard. But yeah, so so we can uh, we can talk about that later. But um, Rab and Chris, you will be my uh, my computer guys. We can see if a theist and an atheist can. Uh, you know, fix fix a computer together. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, welcome, Keegan. You haven't spoke yet at all. What's on your mind today? Not evolution. <laughs> what else is on your mind today? Unless you're not speaking, and we're destined or ordained to have this conversation. Jack, are you speaking? Are you back, Jack? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did have an intro. Oh, you're super hard to hear. I was uh, actually thinking, so, like, if everything right in the general world comes back to God, why do people still deny God's existence? It sounded like he said, why do people still rely on God's existence? But, but Jack, your microphone is, is crazy. It's, it sounds like you're about 10 feet away from your microphone or your phone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There you go. It's not a bit better. Well, that's a million times better. So basically, I was uh, saying, right, so if everything comes back to God, then why do people still deny God's existence? We're denying it. That's the whole point, right? I thought that's the issue. It's our, uh, we're reprobates. We know it and we're lying about it. I think that's uh, the general answer. Romans 1. Um, so Jack, are, are you, a, are you a Christian? 
Well, I'm not particularly religious, but I certainly do believe in, you know, Jesus and all that stuff. Okay, so so the so you do, um, so the when you talk when you talk about God, you're talking about the God of, uh, let's see if I can, let's see if I can quote Nate, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, pretty much something like that, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, the the biggest reason I don't uh, I don't accept that, and I'm pretty convinced that God doesn't exist, is because of the Bible. Well, before you said that, I was going to say you and Reb are going to make great Christians one day. Oh, and here I thought you liked me. <laughs> hey, I, hey, I predicted it, not me. But yeah, I mean, I do, at the end, I still do believe in, you know, Jesus. I do think he was definitely real and he did all those miracles. Well, why, well, why do you think that that, why do you think, was, um, uh, maybe I should ask. So, so you're, you're saying that you, you believe the biblical accounts as written? Oh yeah, yeah. I do believe the Bible is a true story. Why? Why do you believe that? Well, mostly because I, I think it's mostly because I mean, if you think about a lot of a lot of history, I think kind of comes back to that, you know. A lot of history. Oh, like okay. Would would. Do you do you look at the Bible? Oh, hey Sam. Um, sorry, got distracted. I'm I'm a squirrel today. Um, do you think that the Bible as written is like like literally true? So six day creation, and all that stuff. Yeah, like if even if you look even if you look at it from like a science point of view, yeah, it still it still sort of comes back to in a way because. Don't know if you read any articles um, about like some scientists, say, or archaeologists, or some people like that um, found evidence um, of Noah's Ark, like um, basically after the flood. And... Are are you talking about the the uh, oh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Wyatt. Um, that guy who, who apparently found Noah's Ark, is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah, that one, I, I believe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same, the same guy that said he found chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea? I mean, it, it, I think, you know, it's uh, possible that, you know, that he could have, that he could have, you know, definitely found something like that because... You know, was I just don't see how the Bible could be false, personally. That just seems like an incredulity. I, I don't understand, therefore it's true. I like his original question, maybe put it in the chat. It, it didn't go in. It, it was somewhat like what he said, but it, he, he didn't say the whole thing. He says, so if everything comes back to God, why do people still deny he exists if they can't prove it? Which is my stance always. I mean, there's a 50-50 chance both ways since none of us have seen God, right? That's a more interesting question. Rob, you want to take a shot at that? I'm sorry, I just missed that last part. It, it, it was from the chat. Let me just... And then we'll talk about been, who Israel wasn't. Yeah, I've been talking to Chris <laughs> about uh, Orlando. If everything comes right back to God, why do, why do people still deny God exists if they cannot prove it? So I guess the issue would be, like, pragmatically, I'm not sure why I, like, and this is this is me in a Christian room, and I apologize, but, like, I don't see a need for a God to explain anything in my life. I don't see a need to add that into anything. It doesn't seem to add anything to my epistemological framework. So I'm not sure why I need to add that in. So I just start there. I've got reasons to believe that the books are made up and that we have lots of mythologies that have um, crafted over time. And I can point to any number of other things, but at the end of the day, I don't need to prove he doesn't exist. I need to understand what value does it add to me to put it into my into my framework. I want to say eternal life and general well-being. 
but so you'd have to convince me. Like, so first off, I'm totally not convinced I want eternal life. Like, I'm a hundred percent not convinced of that. That that freaks me out to no end. So, like, I'm I'm very happy. Like, really hoping on non-existence. Like, I, I'm I'm good for that. Um, so, like, and I'm I'm already quite happy. So between those two things, it doesn't seem to be adding anything. Well, yeah. So, I mean, just, just that right there. I mean, that would be like, you know, positing, like, you know, you, you know yourself better than the creator. And again, not, not trying to convince you there is one. I'm just saying on its face, yeah. like, you know, under, under this worldview, if there is a creator who certainly knows his creation better than the creation, and, you know, this creation says that, uh, you know, it, it paints like his picture of this eternal existence as something to be desired and great, like the best possible anything. And then you say, well, you know, that freaks me out. I don't want it. Well, I mean, regardless of whether or not you're convinced just on its face the argument would say that if if you if this creator is true and they do know you better than you know yourself which is assumed under this paradigm then you would say well by by default if true then then yes i guess i would want that even though eternal life this concept freaks me out now um it, it certainly wouldn't even though i think it would now on the other side of this thing it would be the best because my creator knows me and he knows that it will be the best and not once i experience it i'll be like oh yes i'm so glad i wanted this well, so, th so, so to be fair, like you're totally right there, Nate, to some degree. And let me just explain what you just is described is why I've actually converted. I used to not believe in the Calvinist God. And I would joke that I didn't have a choice. Uh, and that's why I didn't believe in the mm -hmm. Calvinist God. But but now I don't believe in the universalist God because the universally God is much better to not believe in because he's going to let you go to heaven either way. So I, I'm now an atheist of the universalist God instead. So like, so in that same vein, right? That, so they kind of, yes, if there's not a God, like I'm going to go with not a God, but it, but the God I don't believe in is universalist God that's going to let me in. I like so Calvin God, I like you're more question. sympathetic to? Yeah, ahead, it's Sam. a much happier God. It's a much better God to not believe in. I'm just saying, I, I like the question because it's, 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 it's not necessarily, I mean, we can aim it at atheists, but it, it's a question that it's it's posed to people who believe in God too. I mean, can you prove that God exists? I mean, who are, who who in this room in this can prove that God exists? Where's that person? Contingency argument. How about that? What do you mean, certified? Well, there's something called the contingency argument. It was brought by Gottfried William Leibniz. And it starts with the P PSR, which states that everything either, like, for every proposition, if the proposition is true, then there's sufficient reason for why the proposition is true. So every necessary and contingent fact, th there's an explanation for that fact, right? And now... There's the big conjunctive contingent fact, which is the sum of all contingent facts. And the explanation for the big con conjunctive contingent fact has to be a necessary fact. Because if it was a contingent fact, then it would be part of the big conjunctive contingent fact. Now, now that we have established that the necessary fact is not part of all entities or particulars in physical reality, which are contingent, because they could have not existed, right, in the same way that they do exist. And there's a reason for their existence. And the necessary fact must be something that is immaterial, uh, aspatial, atemporal, um, a bunch of other attributes that I don't have the patience to allow. So, I'm not laughing at what you said, but that last part was hilarious. Yeah, so, and I, I've said this before a lot. So, I mean, so what, what you've described is this, this entity, which doesn't exist in any space, doesn't consist of any matter, and doesn't exist in any time. And I'm having a hard time determining what the difference is between that and something that doesn't exist at all. Because it has causal powers. Well, you, you're, well you're just assigning it. You're, you're just assigning it this, right? How, how does it have causal powers? 
How? Because it caused the universe into existence. Everything I everything either has a reason or a cause. Oh, so like, are you so are you going here from like the the Kalam? No, not the Kalam. Uh, the contingency argument, the PSR. Okay, so, so how did you get from? Okay, you're how, roboting. Oh, sorry. How did you determine that it wasn't a natural cause yet that we haven't figured out yet? Um, because natural things are contingent, could have not existed. Can you give me an example of like, or can you give me a demonstration of something not natural? Demonstrate of of something that is not natural. Um, yeah. God. No, I asked you to demonstrate it, not state it. You're just stipulating it. What What do you mean by demonstrate? Do you want me to point to it or throw well, a rock in there? Well, no, no. What I'm What I'm saying is is that is it. It's the assertion that this this God exists, right? But yeah, that like that's just a stipulation, right? I'm asking like. If 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 it's your contention that this thing is real, I'd like you to I'd like you to demonstrate because if if a god exists, I really want to know. But I'm not okay with you simply saying it exists. I'd like you to to give me some type of demonstration that it exists. Oh, not, okay. Not, okay. Not, you not want simply an explanation. Not not simply a stipulation. Yeah. Okay. So, the PSR is a, it's an it's a fact, right? That cannot be denied unless you deny logic as a whole. Um, it's it's a formula in predicate logic, and it states that for every proposition, if proposition is true, then there's sufficient explanation for why the proposition is true. So what we get is that when logic, right, in any kind, well, not in any kind, but in propositional and predicate logic, either something is a self-contradiction, a contingent fact, or a necessary fact. A self-contradiction cannot have an explanation because it's not a, a true proposition. So either the proposition is a necessary or sufficient fact. In those cases, because the PSR is true, in virtue of the PSR, um, these facts have to have explanations. Now we can create a big conjunctive contingent fact, which is the sum of all contingencies, right, or the sum of all facts in reality. Now, now that we have established that the the fact that explains the big con, con sorry, I was trying to talk. I wanted to clarify. Certified, I thought I was talking. I, I just wanted to clarify before we go down the trail. We shouldn't be going down. Michael, didn't you specifically say like no amount of logic and reason will work here? Work here. You you specifically want something like sights or sounds or something like that. Was was that correct? Well, yeah, I was asking. Or do reason, for, well, reason was, was trails get you for, what you want? Yeah, I was asking for a demo. So words will not help. Well, what what we're going to get to at the end here is is a uh, is is uh, like I've 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 had these discussions, but like these exact discussions with people, and what we end up with is a stipulation, not not a demonstration. Okay, so so yeah, certified. I was just trying to save you time and breath like words is not what he's asking for like he, he wants you to i don't know pull god out of heaven and be like this yeah so i i asked him before if he wants me to demonstrate it in reality he wants me to point at it or throw a rock in there right that was just analogous um i think that's what he wants what yeah so michael i don't see how how that has anything to do like that doesn't make God not exist. But if you if you want to if you want to go that trail, then I can just point to divine revelation, direct experience with the omniscient, omnipotent being. Um, those are like or or miracles. You know, is that is those those are good demonstrations for you? Um, no. Um, well, well, I mean, you have to. We'd have to. You'd have to point out a miracle, and then we'd have to go through what that miracle was, and. We'd have to look at whether or not it had been, um, you know, debunked or something like that. Uh, divine revelation. Um, so something may be relevatory to to you. And this is these these are again these are conversations I've had with lots of different people, right? And so um, 
I, I've, for, for example, I've heard Christians, I've, I've heard some Christians say, well, you know, that one of the best ways to find God is to read the Bible. I've heard other Christians say, you're not going to find God unless he wants to find you. So I'm not sure how, how revelation would, would work. Wait, what do you mean it wouldn't work? Because you can look into like, uh, Islam and Jewish mysticism. I'm not sure if Christianity has mysticism. Nate, can you correct me if I'm right? Is there mysticism? mysticism. Um, well, the ultimate goal of practical mysticism is that it establishes, well, first of all, theoretical mysticism establishes like metaphysics, and sacred texts. Uh, it's like a philosophy about the world and practical mysticism is a direct revelation with an omnipotent omniscient being uh, which it, reveals knowledge to you in a way that he cannot lie. Denial of it would lead to the impossibility of the contrary. So, so um, that, that revelation that you directly spoke of, like they, that you just spoke about. Yeah. Are you, are, so that's personal revelation? What do you mean by personal? Well, well, you, well, if, if you, if uh, I'm looking at what you just said, basically, you know, like revelation, you know, the God revealing himself to you in a way he cannot lie. Like you said something like that. Yeah. And you cannot misinterpret him as well. Right. So that would be personal, no? I guess you can call it that. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then how is it that, how is it that you could demonstrate a personal revelation to me? Wouldn't I have to experience this revelation myself? To demonstrate a revelation to you. Yeah. I mean, I would assume that, well, it hasn't been revealed to me, right? But I would assume that if it has been revealed to me, I would demonstrate to you in a way where uh, it would be absurd for you to deny what I am saying to you. So what you're saying is you have a way, and because this, 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 this could be big news. This could be really big news. Everybody listening, we, we, could, we, could, about, we could be on the verge of having Christianity proven. Um. Uh, what you're, what, I don't what believe you're so saying, trying to prove a Christian God to you. <laughs> well, what, what, yeah, what, I'm just. So, are are you suggesting that you can demonstrate the revelation personally revealed to you is true, and you could demonstrate the truth of it to me? Is that what you just said? Uh, well, okay. Like so that, I that's think. What you said. Yeah, I, I could in a way. Yeah. Well, what, what do you mean, like experientially? Like, ex you want me to? Well, it was your statement. You said you could. Yeah, I could. It to me, in a w in a way that you, that you could prove it was real. So I'd like you to do that. And then we will move yeah, on. Yeah, but I, I've been waiting a while. Yeah, I, I said before that it hasn't. I haven't been revealed to. Uh, I have that knowledge hasn't been revealed to me. Um, but just for pure speculation. Uh, I would demonstrate to you in a way where uh, the contrary would be impossible. Yeah. By pure speculation, you would demonstrate to me that the contrary is impossible. I know what each one of those words means ind independently, but I'm not sure what you mean by that sentence. I'm saying that if we assume that that is the case, that I've been revealed, that I have the, all the preconditions for knowledge, I could uh, show you and demonstrate to you that that is, the, uh, in fact, the case. Oh, sure. If you want to make those assumptions, groovy. How about it? Uh, but do so in about a minute, because uh, then we're going to let Todd speak. Todd? No, no, go ahead. All right, what's up, Todd? How are you doing? You came to the stage. Did you want to jump into this quagmire? Hey, yeah. Good morning. Um, I did. Somebody was talking about proving the existence of God, and I was just going to say that you know, though it can't be proven to anybody, uh, it can definitely have some very strong evidence. And uh, I like to say that the strongest evidence for God is life itself. Um, and I always come down to DNA because if you think about a computer and it uses binary ones and zeros as the code for the language that we use to program, DNA is insanely complex and in that it uses a quaternary digital code to do what it does. And it's not just quaternary code, but it's actually a three dimensional space time quaternary code because it uses four um, literal physical. Um, it's what is it? Quanine. Uh, I don't even know. I can't even think of what it's called right now. 
Hold on. It's uh, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and adenine, you know, the A, G, C, and T that DNA uses. It's, and, and scientists even say that this is a literal digital code. Um, and it uses this in three dimensions to build structures that create your cells that let you live. So this to me is evidence that God has literally put his language into life itself. And he has eternal life in him. And he has given it to us in this code. And that's what helps you live. And if you can't look at this and think that this is the most ridiculously complex uh, thing that we would never be able to do ourselves, you gotta you gotta admit that this comes from some intelligence that's way beyond what we could do. And uh, it's funny when people say that this comes from uh, billions of years of random mutations or chance or whatever. Um, that that's a fairy tale. So I'll just say that. What a time for Rob Tuttle to be a the computer scientist in here a minute ago. He could have addressed what you said a lot better than I could. <laughs> oh, Chris. Rab and I are, are conspiring to have beers when he comes to Orlando the next time. So we're working on that together. I may want in. Yeah, we'll do that. And then I'll bring my friend Bill as well. Oh, I'm far. oh I, 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 I can't talk math. <laughs> you guys are going to get way intellectual. I think to add to what Todd said, something that's even, I wouldn't say greater, but that strengthens that is mind. Mind cannot be explained. There's no logical, physiological explanation for mind. And every living thing on this planet has mind. Down to the smallest amoeba, it has mind. It. I'm not. I'm not sure we can demonstrate. Existency. It knows what oh, its sorry. existence is. It knows what it's supposed to do. How that happened is a complete mystery, and there's no reason for it. Oh, I think there are reasons. I mean, I mean, like, but what, what's in, it's interesting, Sam, you said, you know, that we don't have an explanation for that. But it so it seems to me most apparent that the mind is what the brain does. No, no. Listen to what I'm saying, Mike. I'm saying mind as in everything, every living creature has mind, not like just human, not just a human, but every living creature is intelligent on their level. How did that happen? Well, I have heard a lot of atheists say, or several that I've talked to, that, you know, I guess former atheists, like, somehow arrived at God because consciousness. And, you know, they, they eventually, I guess, wrestled with this. And kind of along the lines of what you're saying, Sam, that's what persuaded them, that there must be something greater, and somehow they got to the Christian God from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think it's interesting because you know what would work for certain people wouldn't work for others. But consciousness seems to be a, a pretty big one that um, gets people to God. In this case, the Christian God somehow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a hard problem of consciousness that you know, I'm certainly not strong. I'm not certainly not smart enough to explain. Um, but Sam, I I agree with you, um, and <laughs> you, you and I always tend tend to find points of agreement, which is good. Um, that, you know, organ, every organism, whether we're talking about a single cell, you know, amoeba or paramecium, uh, all the way up to, you know, us, you know, super, you know, super big bags of chemicals, um, you know, s you know, seems to have, you know, all, all these things. That's, I'm not, sh well, no, it's not, I, I want to try to be charitable, but that doesn't point to, that, at least to me, that doesn't seem evident to point to a, to a creator. Because you could just as easily posit, um, you know, the the ev evolutionary process into that, you know, being kind of quote unquote bred into us over time, right? You know, the the fact that uh, the fact that a single cell organism, uh, quote unquote, knows, you know, how to avoid other organisms that are dangerous to it, versus how quote unquote knows how to go towards other organisms which are friendly and things like that. And so like, like, yes, like what, what you said in one 
sense is totally you know uncontroversial right that that these organisms know how did that happen this is where <laughs> at the, you know at, at the start of the room and it was just i think it was just Nate and me we 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 were chatting about we have to get to the point where we should be comfortable enough to say i don't know i like that answer I, 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 I've always liked that answer. It's, it's a nice hiding place uh, because it's true. <laughs> I, I do not know. We've been in conversations with uh, other uh, people of other persuasions. The Trinitarians on here have been in conversation with people of other persuasions. And when we explain the one God, three persons, people, it, it bothers your logic. But the, the caveat to our understanding is that although we see this in scripture, we do not know how God does this. If we knew, he wouldn't be God. Yeah, and that's something that's never bothered me. Like I said, like like I've said before, when I was a Christian, I was a Trinitarian. I think, uh, I still think that's the only position that you can um, that you can defend biblically. Um, but, you know, but it's, it, it's, <laughs> And and I've said this before too. It's 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 fun for me. Fun, um, <laughs> what some people call fun, other people call stabbing himself in the face with a spoon. But it's 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 fun for me to sometimes sit and listen to people of different faith traditions and different you know soteriology and eschatology and all these different kinds of things have these discussions as a quote unquote outsider to sit and listen right to these people talk about you know oneness versus the Trinity or you know uh, one saved versus conditional salvation things like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting to me too. I mean, that's I think that's I think that's what keeps driving the same question on, on on Clubhouse. I mean, it's the same topic, but it's interesting to listen to hear what other people's perspectives uh, are. This was a good question. I wish we had came up with the question that Jack asked. We could have used it in steel. Man. That's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For anybody who's who's unfamiliar. Um, when, when Sam and I first met some, several months ago, it was, it w we had a really interesting interaction. And then uh, a few days later, he sent me a clubhouse message saying, Hey, I started a club and I, and it's for you and me. And it's called, you know, <laughs> you know uh, steel man, your position with, with Sam and Michael. And we, we've, it's we just kind of like spawned from nothing. It's, it's all Sam's work. I didn't do it. I didn't do anything. Um, and uh, we've had some good conversations there, and uh, we we still need to get together and plan the next one. And things have just been kind of busy and chaotic, but yeah. Yeah, I, we might use his question. I mean, let's see what other people's minds uh, come up with. We know what we're thinking, but it would be nice to hear what other people think. Absolutely. Interesting. Keegan, are you speaking yet? How about you, Mr. Chris? Oh, you know, about to uh, go fix some computers. Watch this always good video. <laughs> oh, hey, you know what? Take a picture of your logic board for me. Like, if you open it up, Nate, take a picture of it and text it to me, and I can probably help you figure out your RAM situation. I know you're oh, looking that's for a good idea. Games, but. You know, the other thing you can do is if you know the model number of your logic board. Um, uh, would it say that somewhere easy, like right on it? Like I see all the stuff talking about should, RAM, except like. Sure. It should well, be printed on the logic board somewhere in the silicone. It'll be etched in there. It'll and it'll say ASUS, something like ASUS, like something, something, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you get the model number, I can just look it up. I can, I can use the uh, DuckDuckGo and figure it out. Notice I didn't say Yes, I appreciate that. You know, I, I, I feel utterly worthless on this stuff. Like, you know, because I, I, if someone shows me something once, I remember it. Like, um, but yeah, trying to like research and read manuals. Like when someone says, oh, just read the manual. I'm like, what? Like, I just, just something about opening the pages. I just start seeing red. I'm like, I hate everything about this. Maybe, maybe that's like a anti-intellectual stance and I hate words. I, I don't know. But I, I just, well, learned, I like experience. I like learning like, by experience. I mean, like, if somebody called me up and was just like, hey, I need, and this is how ignorant I am about Michael's job, but, like, I need some social work 
done. Can you help me? And I'd be like, what? I have no idea. Uh, call this Michael guy because he knows how to get people off drugs, presumably, or whatever social work includes again. I don't know. But, you know, he has his area of expertise. I have my area of expertise. You have your area of expertise. You know. But again. You know, Michael, I do. Oh, go ahead. I do have a question about that, Michael. So as a social yeah, worker, yeah. Um, I remember for a while there was talk in, in America about, um, you know, because, you know, police are race racist and, you know, laws are uh, violence or something, um, that instead of sending police to, like, domestic disturbance issues and things like that, they're going to send social workers. Um, as a social worker, are you in favor of that or not? Like, on one hand, I get I get the the idea that, you know, you wouldn't, you know, you would want to talk these people down and you understand that showing up with force can escalate the situation, stuff like that. But from like a personal safety standpoint, would, would that be something you want to do? Like going into an area that's unknown where there could be danger, alcohol, drugs, and just like present yourself there as like, you know, a mild voice of reason when like knives and bullets could be flying at you. Or would you think, you know, I think we'll let law enforcement handle this. Or both, like, you know, you wait around the corner of a building in a safe location until they make sure there's no threat, and then you talk them down? So I have very strong feelings about this, and I've actually um, done some work with this. Um, so my, my strong feeling is I don't want to – no. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to run into a place with, with uh, bullets and knives, no. But I do think that there is a very strong argument to have law enforcement and social work professionals working in tandem. And I'll tell you why. Um, my experience, so law enforcement's job is to enforce the law, right? And unfortunately, there is too much, there is too much burden placed on law enforcement professionals to be social workers, to be marriage counselors, to be relationship experts, to be all these other things. That's not their job. Their job is law enforcement. And I, I've seen lots of situations where law enforcement will enter a situation, and with, with their, their mandate is to enter a situation, assess, neutralize, then ask questions, right? They, they have to basically take control of a situation before they start having all these, these conversations, which I, think is, which I think is fine from a safety perspective. A police officer has no business trying to quote unquote, talk someone down off a ledge. That's not their job. So, um, so yes, I'm completely in favor of having social work, not necessarily full-blown quote unquote social workers, uh, but social work professionals, perhaps child and youth workers, depending on what, what area uh, of, of law enforcement's being dealt with, uh, things like this. I'm completely 100%, in favor. Of, man. 100%. Yeah, yeah, in favor of law law enforcement and social work professionals working in tandem because it's a law enforcement officer's job to enforce the law full stop that's the end of their mandate so send in the cavalry to make sure the social worker will not be full of holes and then send them in to talk to them but yeah that gets back to community policing and like the whole idea right nate i mean you were a cop you know way better than most of us i mean i'm sure you, you the only time like, when i talk to cops the, the thing I always hear is you always meet people on the worst day of their lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had to do, uh, you know, more, more counseling than I, I thought, you know, I, I should. But, um, you know, in my situations, it turned out okay. I mean, you know, it, but... Um, nobody calls the police when everything's groovy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's also the other thing, you know, you, you, like you have enough, I mean, we have enough to handle... Um, you know, it's like mid, almost, almost like I don't know the percentage, but it's really high. Like, you know, the the typically uh, female partner will call for the domestic abuse. Like, he's going to kill me. He's strangling me. He's choking me. You know, he's, he's going to kill me. Help, help, help. The police get there. You know, the guy has a knife. You know, we use force reasonable and necessary to neutralize a threat. And then um, we're like, okay, well, you know, because where I was a cop at, there was a law. And someone on the domestic call someone had to go to jail like an arrest had to be made that is out of our hands that was the law we would be breaking the law to not do that so we go there we clearly identify the guy with you know the knife or whatever maybe covered in blood or whatever not his own and you know the the victim typically the female female partner uh, who's like covered in blood or has like it's just obvious and we're like okay well we have to take someone to jail so it's gonna be the guy holding the knife um and then the 
female partner will oftentimes end up getting arrested from attacking police who are now taking this guy to jail. She's like, I didn't need it, I didn't need it, I love him, don't take him, you're monsters, blah, 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 I'm gonna sue, I'm gonna blah, blah, blah. And then they'll turn violent towards the cops, so more times than not, both of them end up going to jail because now you have one where one's a domestic abuse, now the other one who was the, originally the victim has to get charged with, you know, assaulting law enforcement officer. Um, I'm like, it's, it's no good situation. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that, that would be a difference between laws because, you know, a lot of times, if laws weren't in place to force the cop's hand, they may be like, look, I understand you're having a bad day, blah, 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 depending on the level of assault they're facing. But it's like, you know, when you have laws that mandate arrest, then take it up with your congressman. Like, that's, that's all we've got. Um, anyways, uh, another note real quick. Someone commented on the hammer in my PTR. Chris, did you know that apparently, I haven't fact-checked this, but I guess I don't have any reason not to believe crazy stuff that comes from Rome. Um, this apparently is the Pope hammer that when a pope dies, they knock on their head with it three times to make sure they're really dead. So I don't know if that's to check they're dead or one way or another, they're not Bro. coming out of this head knocking alive. That that's is crazy. kind of awesome. A pope hammer. Have you ever, have so, you ever, do, do a, do a search on pope deaths. Like how popes <laughs> died. That will be, and, and Michael, I highly suggest this for you as well. It'll be an entertaining two hours of your life. Um, there was one guy um, in the 700s that, or no, 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 1100s rather, um, that uh, was known as a womanizer. And he was in the castle of some Italian duke or whatever they call them, lords, or I don't know what they call them in Italian. Um, and uh, he was uh, having coitus with this guy's wife and uh, jumped out the window when the guy came in with a sword to confront them and didn't realize he was in a ginormous tower um, because of, the, I guess, the way the castle was constructed and fell 45 feet to his death. <laughs> well, that is interesting. Uh, mister, what's up? You've been waiting for a while. How's your day going? Anything on your mind? I was, I was going pretty well, man. You guys seem to be having a great discussion about real world issues, so you know, fun. Pope's jumping to their death. <laughs> yeah, because I definitely wouldn't want uh, people dealing with uh, you know criminals or domestic situations like that without weapons, man. Because you know you're gonna run into a lot of people with personality disorders in that profession, so. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend going unarmed into a situation like that for anyone, or at least, uh, or at least have somebody who's got a, a weapon. Yeah, I'd one hundred percent agree. Like you have to, you know, of course, maintain safety, right? Like the, you know, the like in a situation that I was proposing, you know, like a law enforcement officer, social worker working in tandem, right? The social worker can't do anything if the social worker's dead. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, like you, you, you have to ensure safety, of course. Um, but uh, but th that would be the hope that you know once the situation is quote unquote you know assessed slash uh, uh, neutralized, that um, be because in in that situation, like just imagine, like Nate, with what you said, right? So you go there, you know the whole somebody, you know the whole one's got to go. Uh, I get that, and so okay, so one goes, but then, like it was a purely emotional response. For, for the partner to attack law enforcement in yeah. no, like in, in no, in no environment, did you want to have to arrest that person? Right. So that's where the social worker comes in and kind of like acts as he goes, whoa, 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 you know, stop for a second, take five seconds, breathe. Let's talk about this. Right. And has the capacity to, you know, kind of interrupt that, like interrupt that thought process. And insert a little bit of reason, talk that per talk that person, quote unquote, down off the ledge, um, so that so that you're not arresting two people. Because then you know the 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 ripple effects that can come from that possible you know children in the house. Now you have to in involve CAS or in your case a CPS and all these other things, all because you didn't have somebody there to properly assess all sides of a given situation. Yep. Sounds reasonable to me. 
What do you think, New Michael? How are you, New Michael? I'm doing just great. Um, I have a question. Uh, I believe this is a Christian um, room. I have a major First uh, Peter 315 salvation question. And it's in sure, the context. Sure. Yes, it's in the context of First Corinthians 15, 17. I'm sure you all are familiar with it. You may want to read it just for those who may not be. First, first, first Peter 315, if you can just read that real quick. Uh, it's going to take That's me a second, second to grab the Bible. Anyone else available to do that? Chris, unless you're climbing in a rooftop somewhere. What was the um, verse? Be prepared for... First Peter 315. 315? Yeah, always be prepared to give a witness for the faith that lies within you, but do so with gentleness and respect. Man, okay. now, even the atheist knows it better than you guys. That's a shame. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Right. Uh, now, the, the question is in context of First Corinthians fifteen seventeen. This is the context. If Christ be not risen, because it the whole foundation of salvation through Christ is based upon Christ to rise from the dead on the third day. Without the resurrection. There's no salvation. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, my, my question here is in Luke 24, 46. That's where my question, Luke 24, 46. And the words are in red. And Jesus declares that a prophecy was given by the creator, Yah, in the law and the prophecy. And the prophecy is that Christ to rise from the dead on the third day. So my, my simple question is where where in the law and the prophets, where, where did the creator Yah give a prophecy for the children of Israel that Christ would rise from the dead on the third day? That's an easy one. Yeah. And this is so, chapter 18. Okay, let, me, and then we'll let, me, let me land my plane and then, then you can get it. Did Jesus lie on the creator Yah? Did the creator Yah ever say these words? Did these words ever proceed directly out of the mouth, out of the very mouth of the creator Yah? Did Yah ever say Christ to rise from the dead on the third day? Can you show, Genesis, show these chapter words? 18. Yeah, show, yeah, show these Genesis words. Chapter, Genesis okay. chapter 18 but, and then the book of Jonah. Okay, Jesus. correct. And so the Bible yeah. isn't used as a series of proof texts. You cannot read the Bible that way. The Bible doesn't say, and God said, do this and do that. Did, where does it say that you have to follow all 613 of the laws? It just says that you have to follow the laws. Well, does it say specifically 613? No, it just says you follow the law. So what you're asking, you're, you're setting your question up to try to already win the argument by the way that you frame your question. And it's simply an invalid question. So so what you're saying that, that the words Christ to rise from the dead on the third day never proceeded out of the mouth of the creator of God? So, so well, no, so if I, I can hearken saying, back to John 537 real quick, it says no one has ever heard the voice of Yah. So are you blaspheming against Yah? Because Yah, no one has heard the voice of Yah. Peace be upon him. So are you blasphemous right now? Uh, no. In Amos 3, 7, it says, The Lord God will do no thing, but he reveals his secrets unto his servant, his prophet. So does any In Deuteronomy 29, 29, cut, says, Let the right, secret things. Off. No, we're going to yeah. cut you off, Mr. No, Hebrews. You like, just go away. We, no, I'm not going to call Go ahead, you. Chris. I'm so ahead, tired. Chris. I'm so tired of you guys coming in here with your cultic doctrines. You're trying to act all gentle and nice. And you're like, I just have a question. And so here's my series of questions. And I'm going to walk you through my preset package. And I'm just done with it, man. If you want to have a genuine discussion, fine. If you want to learn theology from people who actually know theology, fine. If you want to come up here and try to teach, no, go away. To be fair, uh, this was coming off the heels of some more of your clan members yesterday telling us, uh, you know, they were going to enslave us and put us in chains. So, hey, um, well, you know, he's while I would say it a little, little more peaceful he's than Chris did, I understand the ire. Huh? 
He's gone. He's not even in the room anymore. Yeah. No, I see him down there. Michael, he's down oh, there. No I man. helped him down in the audience because he wouldn't be quiet. Anyways, so um, there you go. But yeah, I agree with Chris. So, um, you know, you can't have a doctrine that says you're going to enslave everyone other than your race and expect people to, you know, be happy when you want to teach them something about how they can be a good heavenly footstool for their masters. Um, that's, uh, you know, heretical and blasphemous. And I hope you find Jesus. It's the actual Jesus. Uh, anyways, oh, yeah. what's up, Earl? Oh, oh, I was I was hoping that we could show him show him the prophecies of the resurrection. That's what I was waiting. Well, show him. He's down there listening. Show him. I'll bring him back oh. up eventually. If we think he needs to respond, but yeah, I mean, I like people to police themselves, but you know, everyone was talking over each other, and he asked a question and then wouldn't allow an answer, so I just helped him. So, go ahead and go ahead and respond if you like, Earl. Maybe he'll uh, listen and want to say something. I got you. Uh, oh, so, it says uh, you running Genesis, scared, so, you know. Yeah, Genesis 18, Thinking, yeah. starting at verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, uh, uh, Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men, no, 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 that's not it. Uh, what's the chapter, man, where he was sacrificing Isaac? What chapter is that? I thought it was 18. Is it three? Oh, maybe it is 18. Is it? I don't know. No, no, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. It maybe was before that. It, you know what? Yeah, I think it might have been Genesis 14, actually. Maybe. No, maybe it's 15. What are you looking for? Let us help you. What What are you looking for? What passage? Yeah, the, the, the chapter where he was sacrificing Isaac. Uh, 13. 13. Oh, wait. That was nope. That's Abraham a lot. <laughs> oh, someone said Genesis 22. Yeah, Genesis 22. So as, I'm as just trying to get to my microphone. <laughs> as someone oh, here, who's not okay, real yeah, familiar so... with uh, the Hebrew Israelite thing, is the whole, is, is the Yah thing, is that one of the, the telltale markers? It's... Yeah, it's their word for God for some reason because vowels or something like that. But it's it's their word for God. Michael, feel free to answer in chat. But yeah, that's that's their word. It's, it's kind of like how a lot of Unitarians will be. It, it's yeah, it's because like a lot of people who are Unitarians for some reason will be like Yahovah, and you know some quasi Hebrew related reason they'll like mess up Yahweh and you know just say Yahovah and mess up Jehovah because J is not in Hebrew and that makes them closer to God or something. So what Anyways, is, I'm gonna get, they've got a yeah, fake go language called Lashawan Kadash that was made up by a guy who didn't speak Hebrew um, in uh, in New York City about whatever, I think, like 100 years ago. And it's just it's just made up. And uh, if you go to Faithful to Yahweh's channel, he's got entire whole sections on Lashawan Kadash and where it comes from and how stupid it is. And these people, they just they are ignorant because they're willfully ignorant. Faithful to Yahweh, don't... Oh, no, not... You're not talking about Terry, are you? No, 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 no. Uh, Faithful is like a... He's a YouTube guy that's on Clubhouse that just uh, does apologetics with Hebrew Israelites. Oh, pardon me. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking of somebody else who's a, just a garbage waste of time. Oh, no, no, no. Um, yeah, Faithful to Yahweh, the reason I say his name like that is because his... I can't really use his real name because he gets lots and lots and lots and lots of death threats. Well, that's never cool. I, I don't understand why someone like, like even as, as, as vehemently as I disagree with, you know, with people of any, any faith tradition, I, I don't, I don't get the whole, I'm gonna kill you. I, like where, where'd that come from? Like what, like what gets you to that? It's just so silly. Well, and so it's so they they use these tactics to silence their critics because their their stuff is so incomprehensible and it's just so easily disputed by a simple Google search that they have to be able to keep control over people and so they'll use violence as a means of control. Um, 
you know, Michael, you and I vehemently disagree on almost every topic, but yet we can, you know, be nice to each other and not just, you know, because you're Canadian, but because you're a decent human being. Whereas you get somebody like this Michael guy who at his core is murderous. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to be nice because their core is murderous. But, but, but what's, what's, what's weird to me, and, and this, this is true for anyone of any faith tradition who, 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 who resorts to violence with, with, you know, in the, in the hope of trying to either get their point across or whatever it is. That's the thing that's always made me shake my head the most is because in, in, in your faith tradition, like the people who don't see your way, they're going to get their comeuppance anyway. So why you feel the need to hurry them along to that is just weird. Because they have hate in their heart. And the more they can eternally pay for, you know, whatever sin they think, uh, you know, give them an extra few years in hell. And that's even better because they are evil people. Hey, by the way, I posted um, everything you'll ever need to know about Hebrew Israelism at the top link. Um, it was Bobby uh, a couple of days ago. It is great. Um, it, <laughs> anyways, take a gander of that. It's like a seven minute rant he goes on. I don't think he breathes one time. It's amazing. Anyway, that will bring you up to speed on Hebrews rights. Uh, Michael, check that out too. Let us know if you got anything wrong. Of course he didn't, but you know, give us your thoughts. Love to hear them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I post, um, mentioned something in the messages about particular furs that, it's always kind of uh, baffled me, and it says um, something to do with about those who do not hate their parents cannot be my disciple. Like, can someone explain that? Say that again. Yeah, so you know the first, um, like, those who do not hate their parents cannot be my disciple. Like, it means put God above all else. Like if you're like, I love my parents, uh, you know, and they have a different God. Therefore, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to break their heart and go after, you know, go after a different God. I mean, by contrast, yeah. Be like, no, no, I want to follow this God so much. Um, you know, by contrast, you could say, I hate my mom and dad. I'm like forsaking their way, forsaking their idols, forsaking their gods. Um, they're going to be like, why do you hate us, son? So like that. And real quick to chat, uh, Yahweh tells the Israelites how to treat the victims of war as property, what do you expect? Um, doesn't say to murder them. I mean, sometimes it, sometimes it says to wipe everyone off, but as it re relates to prisoners of war, I mean, by definition, they're not murdered. They're prisoners. Anyways, uh, yeah, that's that's the answer, Jack. Yeah, I think it's Luke 14, 26 um, that, that says that. And there's a few things, you know, like if you don't hate your, uh, hate your mom and dad, and in fact, even your own life, you can't be my disciple. I think it's something like that. Pretty sure it's Luke 14, 26. <laughs> Someone wants to answer Michael in that chat. He keeps spam posting the same thing over and over about Jesus in the third day. I haven't read it all yet. I'm in the middle of a Fortnite battle. Is his question, where does the Bible say that Jesus Christ is going to rise on the third day? Uh, yeah, he wanted a prophecy specifically from the mouth of Yah um, oh, that yeah. says can Jesus I, is going to rise. Can I still read that for him? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Harold. Sorry, I forgot about you. Uh, yeah, it's Genesis. Yeah, well, most people do. It's all good. Genesis uh, 13. We love you, boo. 22. Uh, I'm going to just read it quickly, man, because I'm not even going to. Uh, where does it say that? Let me see. Genesis 22. I'm trying to find that verse where it says, and on the third day he went up. Um, well, it's somewhere in the chapter. I can't find it right now because I don't want to take too long. But it's it's when Abraham is going up onto the mount to take uh, to take Isaac, and then it says that he went up on the mount the third day. Uh, and Abraham told the two young men at the bottom of the mount. He said, "Wait here, and you and I, you and not." Or it says, uh, "I and the lad will return unto you again." So uh, that's an example of resurrection. Go ahead. Hey, Tim. Remember and then, of course, today. you know, Christ himself already said, just as Jonah was in the heart of the earth for three days, or the, in the belly of the whale for three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. 
Um, so, you know, and the way Jonah reads, uh, if you read the book, I mean, the prayer that he was praying, he was essentially dead uh, in this whale or yeah, the whale. So it's, it's not really, it's not, a, it's not a whole lot. You have to really dissect, but you have resurrection well, yeah. taking place on the third day, on the third day in two separate situations. In the oh, you've got it more than that. So I'm not going to pin the link because I want to leave the Hebrew Israelite link up and Harold, your microphone is awful. Um, if you could figure out a way to make it louder and cut out the background noise, that'd be super awesome. But yeah, so um, he changed his question. His question was from the mouth of Yah. So then he says where Jesus falsely claims. So if he's saying Jesus is Yah, hey, we agree on something. I don't think that's what he meant, though. Meant, though. But uh, yeah, so if you want to go to gotquestions.org, why did Jesus rise on the third day? Where did he say this? Apparently, it's recorded 21, uh, 21 references. Matthew 12, 40, Mark 8, 31, Luke 9, 22, John 2, 19, 20. Anyway, so he says, yes, uh, you know, like he, uh, Harold just said, as, you know, Jonah and, you know, the Son of Man will be, uh, be raised in three days. And, uh, you know, Jesus also he predicts his death and resurrection. He says, um, it's my life. I lay it down. No one takes it. I lay it down again, and I have the authority to take it up again. Who has the authority to resurrect the dead besides Yah? And even if you say Elijah or something like that, they didn't do it under their own power. They did it under the authority of Yah. So um, that is your answer. So, I mean, you can't okay. say it's not in there. You can say you don't believe it or Jesus isn't Yah, even though you just alluded to Jesus being Yah. Um, so maybe you just mistyped. But um, you can't yeah. say it's not in there. It's in there many, many times. So and the last thing there you go. Is, is we understand Jonah, both Jonah and Abraham, the Bible clearly says that they were prophets. Uh, and God said in the book of Hosea that he speaks to his prophets in uh, dreams, visions, and similitudes. Similitudes means, you know, that he's showing them something similar that is to come later on. He's painting a picture for them of something that's supposed to happen or take place in the future. So even if the word, you know, there's not necessarily, oh, you know, thus saith the Lord, when my Christ comes, I'm going to raise him up on the third day. Just because it doesn't say that verbatim doesn't say, doesn't mean or doesn't take away from the simple fact that God spoke to his prophets in similitudes and showing them visions and pictures of things that were to come later on. So, uh, and yes, the Bible does say that Abraham was a prophet. It says it right there in Genesis, calls him a prophet. I believe it's in Genesis 14. Um, and of course, Jonah is a prophet as well. So there you have that. Um, the Bible even calls David a prophet. Um, David prophesied at least on two separate occasions in the book of Psalms of a resurrection taking place. You have that in Psalm, I believe it's 110 either Psalm 16 or 110, and then you have Psalm 144, uh, where G or David prophesies of a resurrection taking place, and also him and all of his children being brought back from the dead by a particular Savior. Uh, yeah, man, yeah, you have, you have many different things. Uh, even the tree of life is symbolic of the resurrection as well. Because if you eat of the tree of life, you shall live forever after being dead. Yeah. Resurrections all throughout the whole Old Testament. Okay. And all so this you know what you do? Right. Yeah. So you know what you do when someone says, why are you running scared? Answer my question. And we answer the question. And they say, why are you running scared? Answer my question. And we answer the question. And they do that and do that and keep doing that. <laughs> I think we just stopped talking about it. What's up, Todd? You got a new topic on your mind? Uh, nope, <laughs> not really. Got an old topic on your mind? I was just, I was just looking over this whole question about what we just answered, actually, about Jonah and Abraham, and even in Hosea, it talks about the third day being raised up. I mean, there's multiple places in Scripture that talks about being raised up um, on the third day after being dead. So this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He needs to hey, read Todd, a little bit. Tell us something about your understanding of the doctrines of demons. 
Well, the doctrines of demons, that would be anything that teaches against the truth of Scripture. Um, I mean, there could be many different ways to think about that, but uh, where do you want to start? There's, um, there's the, from what I've heard, there's a uh, Catholic teaching and the things that Catholics teach that could be considered doctrines of demons because it can uh, lead you astray if you are putting faith in your own works or in the church and not your faith fully and totally in the work of Jesus Christ, then uh, y you, can, you can be damned. So there's that. Drop the link. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm not removing the black Hebrew Israelite uh, link at the top. That's gold. You can spend five seconds like we all did and Google. Jesus says he'll rise on the third day. Google that. If I mean, if you honestly can't type or speak the words, I will do it for you. Send me a back channel. But I have faith in you that you have the ability to say into a search engine, maybe DuckDuckGo, Chris, where did Jesus say he would rise on the third day? And let me know if you need help reading. I can narrate it for you. Um, I'm just not going to take down that link about why <laughs> black Hebrew Israelites aren't Israelites. That's staying. Nate, man, you are something. You said it. You need help reading. I'll narrate it for you. I mean, I want to be helpful. I mean, they just they uh, well, have this pagan nonsense that they appeal to, and it's just it's just tiresome. I'm sorry for losing my my temper, but like. You know, and again, you know, why he started with First Peter 3.15, again, he was attempting to trap people by, you know, tone policing them. And you know what? Um, Jesus cleared out the temple with a whip. And that's what needs to be done um, proverbially, not literally, again, with, you know, people that are in these doctrines of demons is they have to be, they have to be told in no uncertain terms, you know, that they need to repent and believe. And, and the other thing about it is like, we're not even talking about anything extraordinary with these guys. All we're talking about is like, hey, maybe what you guys should do is examine the scriptures for yourselves instead of reading a preset package put together by your leaders. Anyway, um, yeah, just uh, commented an interesting question for you all to answer if you want to in the um, chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was the question about the beast of the sea? You want to get that one, Chris? Is that what you're mm -hmm. talking about? Uh, well, let's like, see. The, the um, other thing, too, that Michael, it may be interesting. Michael says that the year of judgment is 2023. So, oh, I think what he means is by drop the link is put a link in the chat to where the old testament talks about the resurrection of jesus um sure you can put the link in the chat are you talking about dropping the link at the top because we're not going to do that um oh yeah i can totally can do, yeah sure we're, we're more than happy to do that you can go forth and do your own research my friend but i'm actually really interested he made a timed prophecy for us that 2023 will be the year of judgment upon the edomites presumably yeah. So anyway, uh, I was going to ask it to you. Uh, my question was, first of all, do you believe that unicorns are slash were real? And um, they are anything like, and are they anything like they're portrayed in, say, the stories and fairy tales that you might have read as a kid? Nah, I'm sorry, say that one more time. I was, I was getting the link for this guy. I wasn't paying attention. I'm, you have my... Focus. Go ahead. And were say that unicorns again, real? No, unicorns were used in the King James version of the Bible in weird anachronistic language. It's not what the Hebrew says. So, what do you think? Like a unicorn, like was then? Like if say there was a creature that was say similar to it, like that existed. Like, what do you think it would have been like? I mean, a horse. A horse. Is a horse, of course, of course. Can anybody, can anybody get that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So but then like, it needs to I get mean, the horn from then. Well, so look, unicorns were used widely throughout British 
um, literature and um, British mythology for all sorts of things. And so the word just made it into the King James version of the Bible. So you don't see it anywhere besides that. Um, and so I just don't think that unicorns were real. We have no evidence of any species ever existing with a horse with a giant unicorn horn. Now, that being said, people thought narwhals were fake for a long time. Turns out narwhals are real. Um, and they have ostensibly what would be the closest thing in nature to a unicorn horn. Um, so you could, you could say that somebody found a, found a fossil in Northern England of a narwhal that, you know, had washed up or of a dead narwhal or something and called it a unicorn. I, I mean, we have no idea what the origins of these words or beliefs or mythologies are, but suffice to say, we don't have any good, um, you know, scientific proof that actual horses with horns that look like narwhal horns actually existed. Yeah, another... Well, hey, give the narwhals long enough and maybe a narwhal will evolve into a horse and there you go, unicorn. Oh, there you go, yeah. That's from Michael. Um, yeah. well, Chris, there's a, there's one question that says uh, from Janaid. Who is the beast of the sea and beast of the land, which talks about the book, which it talks about in the book of Revelation? I would need the specific reference. Hey, real quick, yeah, I was talking about the uh, unicorns. Yeah, Junaid, uh, uh, put up the uh, reference if you have. Yeah, also, another theory that I think I've heard somewhere is um, apparently some theorize that. The person who claims to have spotted the unicorn actually just uh, mistook it for like a rhinoceros or something, as they tend to have quite big. Yeah, it's, it's the rhinoceros, not, you know, an actual unicorn. It's referring to a rhinoceros. Yeah, uh, so let's see, is Janaid still here? Janaid, yeah, give us the chapter and verse you're talking about. I have an idea, but just to make sure we're talking about the exact same passage. So give us chapter and verse and we'll talk about that. And divinely inspiration. Nate, would you mind addressing the misinterpretation of Levitican law and its continued use by my brothers to condemn homosexuality when it's not against God's law? Uh, my question, who, what brothers are you speaking of? Like, I'm just kind of side note, curious your position. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's, if you're not an Israelite, the 613 Levitical laws were not meant for you. If you wanted to live among them, there was some that you had to adhere to, like, you know, not murder, steal, things like that. So there were some laws you had to adhere to to be around these people. But if you were not an Israelite, these are not your laws. That being said, um, I can't say rightly, biblically, you can't say that homosexuality is not a sin. So although you're not an Israelite and these are not your laws, there are, you know, laws of the spirit that it talks about, you know, you, if you read the whole Bible, you'll get it. And, you know, Paul says... Uh, that there's a whole litany of things that are against God's law, are against God's nature, are against morality, and these things you cannot do. So it says, you know, adulterers, liars, fornicators. So not just homosexuals, but anyone, you know, outside the bonds of, you know, God's view of marriage, um, anyone, male, female, straight, doesn't matter, anyone in fornication um, outside of marriage um, and homosexuals and like other people will all have their part in a lake of fire. So that's uh, really strong terms uh, says, don't be these things, don't do these things. So I would say that. So as far as Levitical law, sure, if you're not Israelite, you're good. But that doesn't exempt you, you know, from from the all-encompassing law um, that says these things, among plenty of others, uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God and will have their part in the lake of fire. Um, so I would encourage everyone to not have their part in the lake of fire, including you, Michael. Repent and believe the gospel. Salvation can be yours today. Let us know if you looked at that link because I did post the link. Anyway, I've uh, just got to go. Uh, my phone's getting low. <laughs> it's like, I've also got to go out soon anyway. So, yeah. Well, good chat, Jack. Take care. Have an awesome day. Uh, Andrew, were you uh, still saying anything or? No. Oh, no, no, no. I was just listening. Oh, Hello. man, now Michael's hitting us with the uh, two totally different Gospels. This is fascinating. I, I don't, I, I know I shouldn't, but I almost want to ask, what are the two totally different Gospels? I don't know. I want to find out. Uh, what, what, Millie? What's up, Millie? How's life? It's about to get worse. <laughs> How are you guys? Well, <laughs> ask me, a, ask me 20 worse. minutes. 
<laughs> that was funny. That's a good list. <laughs> well, Michael says the year of judgment is 2023. So if you're not a Hebrew Israelite, um, I, I guess we're all going to be judged. But what's up, Owen? I get to be a slave in the just, kingdom sooner than I thought. It's got a question, guys. Um, was Judas was Judas the guy that deceived Jesus Christ? Was was he a disciple of of Jesus? Uh, well, he didn't see uh, he didn't deceive him. I mean, he tried, but it wasn't successful. So Jesus, you know, called out and said, you know, this guy that was always a son of perdition from the beginning, he was always always evil from the very beginning, and. Uh, so, but yes, he, he I, I don't even know if I'd say Judas tried to deceive because, you know, he was, he was surely probably a pretty good guy at the beginning. Um, but over time, we, the Bible doesn't say exactly how it happened, his progression, other than, you know, the biblical account, biblical account like, you know, for, he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed him, and, uh, you know, Satan entered him. And that's when, that's when everything happened. But as far as like, you know, how good of a guy was he a... a, a was he a nice, peaceful guy that didn't really believe in Jesus? Like, uh, I don't know. It doesn't tell us, like, his mind state leading up to that point, really, except he was a thief. So I'm um, probably not a good guy. But, you know, Jesus also knew that uh, when he was crying about, you know, how um, someone used a lot of expensive perfume to, like, prepare Jesus' body for burial. Um, and Jesus says, and, and Judas complains and says, this, this money is like a year's wages. It could have been used to give him the poor, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus says, she's anointing me for my burial, by the way, also predicting his death right there. Um and says, uh, you'll always have the poor, but you won't always have me. She does a good thing. So, uh, and then it goes on to say, you know, Judas, by the way, the guy griping that this could have been used for the poor was in charge of the money and was using it deceitfully. And, you know, like we would call that taking a little off the top or something. So, uh, yeah. But was Judas always trying to deceive Jesus from the very beginning? Eh, probably not. The Bible wouldn't indicate that, but he was definitely always going to betray Jesus. So whether he knew it or not, or at what time he knew it or not, we don't really know, but that's the answer. So yes, that is a guy that attempted to deceive Jesus. No, the question was, sorry, mate. The question was, was he a disciple of Jesus? Yes. Okay. Would you say he was one of the 12 disciples? Yeah. Okay. Can we go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5? Are you sorry, already there? We'll, we'll put it in context. Verse 4. Yeah, I'm already there. You want me to read it out? Sure. Okay. First Corinthians 15, verse 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that was and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. How would you guys um, translate that? Who is the twelve? Well, the first thing I say is that's a great scripture um, to answer, answer Michael, uh, his previous question, reference back to the third, days, the third day of Jesus being resurrected. But, uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's fair. Anyone want to speak to it? Yeah, so the 12 was just a, was just a name that they had for those disciples. It doesn't mean that he went individually to all 12, because we see also in John that Thomas wasn't there the first time the quote-unquote 12 were meeting. And so we get from the context of what the quote-unquote 12 means. Um, it is always a context to the original 12 disciples. Now, was okay. Judas a member of that? Yes. Um, was he replaced in Acts chapter 1? Yes, with Matthias. And so then the 12 continued as a thing. But to say that there's an inconsistency because Judas had already killed himself um, after the, the crucifixion, um, that would not be a, a valid interpretation. Okay, so he wasn't of the 12 disciples that Paul is speaking of here. No, he's, okay, again, you're, you're misinter you've just misquoted what I just said. No, no, I said, said and that 12... he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. My question was, right. then of the twelve. But you're not 12. listening well, to my well, answer again. Yeah, right right there, Millie. You just mess like, by your own logic, like, seen by Cephas, and then the twelve. Cephas was part of the twelve. So now are you trying, by your own logic, to say there was actually 13 disciples? So no, you, I think you're, you're answering Cephas, your own question. Then of the twelve. So Cephas is separate from the twelve, isn't he? 
No. Yeah. Well, would, but the way you're trying to read it, you would say it, it was seen Cephas, by Cephas and then the other 11. No, no. Because I have Cephas, no being clue. one of the 12, saw him. I have no yes. clue whatsoever of scripture. I'm asking a Christian. As We're the telling you. title says. Right. So my We're just trying is, to tell you what it means, but as you don't want to listen. Of, <laughs> no, no, you're not listening to me. You're, you're just. Um, so the question again, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. Does that mean. Of the twelve, then of the twelve, the twelve, the word twelve, Paul is talking about the twelve. Does it include Judas? Yes, but read in the chat as well. Pastor Mark answered your question the same way I did. The twelve is a generic term for the twelve disciples. It doesn't mean that they were all together. It doesn't mean that it's numbering every single one of them. It's just a name given to the original twelve. It has nothing to do with the content of what the twelve were. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So, verse four says, and that it would be he was like buried, it would be like me and, and it would be like me and Nate being the two, or me and Nate and Todd being the three. Now, if Todd is you know off working, it doesn't mean that the three doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that Todd is no longer part of the three. It just means Todd's off working. And so, if we have a name for me and Todd and Nate as the three then then that that's all it is it's just a name and, and i don't understand why you're getting this hang up where you're trying to take it ultra ultra wooden literally to try to find some type of a contradiction I'm not, I mean, because I'm that's not, what you're doing well, we even i'm not well, I'm no not, wait, we even do this and can i speak we, mike my case whoa can I speak no my... you can take a breath and chill the heck out i've been like as a moderator super quiet and i'd like to you know get a word or two in so you can calm yourself compose yourself and uh you know Realign your chakras and chi, and maybe we'll bring you back up. But the one thing I was going to say, which of course you're not listening now, so you're going to act like we didn't say this. In pop culture, we do this. There was in the last few years a movie called uh, Magnificent Seven and another movie called The Hateful Eight. And they're both Westerns, I think. But some of them died in it. And you know what? They were still referred to as The Magnificent Seven and The Hateful Eight, even after some died. So we still see this. So I was going to be a little nicer but I see there's no reason. So you're just obstinate to this, and I don't, I don't know what your intention is other than, I, well, I mean, I know what your intention is, but get it together. Like, if you ask a question that's been answered, instead of, like, being a Pharisee and trying to, like, litigate something, didn't work out so well for them, get a new question. Like, if you think God's false and everything we're saying is wrong, fine. So go get a new problem. But we answer one problem you're having, so instead of beating it to death, everyone can see what you're doing, and no one's no one's taking the bait, so get a new question, get a new argument. You hate God, you don't believe in God, fine. Just get something else to talk about. Chris, you're rubbing off on me. I, I think this is one of the examples of where, you know, you, you know, you quote unquote ask a Christian, and they give you an answer. Like, I mean, like your, your answer to, like, if, if, if you keep reading in that text when it talks about it, I have other problems with it, right? Um, but it's fair to say you answered the question. It, it might be not. It might not be particularly satisfying to an individual, but I don't think it's fair to say you didn't answer the question. If you know, I I don't think it's a, a, a great thing either because when that's with you know, like one of the problems that I have with that is it says you know that uh, Jesus appeared to five hundred people. The problem is we don't have five hundred bits of testimony. We have what, like one guy wrote that down. Right. But anyway, I don't, I don't want to offshoot into a different problem, but that that's yeah, I think you answered the question. I didn't find it particularly satisfying either, but hey, you know, hey, shock of shocks. We disagree. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, isn't that in Luke? Like, isn't Luke a compilation of different accounts? So it's not like I, Luke, am writing every single thing. It's like I, Luke, uh, you know, consolidated multiple accounts and now include that in the gospel. So I'm not crazy. It is, it is Luke, right? It's the compilation. So even though one guy is, is compiling and authoring it. And certainly, you know, puts his own finger on it as author. Like, it's not like he's like, hey, I'm the only one that saw this. He's getting multiple accounts and multiple, you know, multiple things and consolidating them into the gospel of Luke. Yeah. Correct. And yeah. And correct. then we have to go into, well, you know, it, it, it kind of, it kind of goes down or it can easily go down other trails. Like, well, when was it written? And we don't know the actual author's name and all those other things I'm not qualified to talk about. Right. But, you know, again, this is where conservative scholarship and liberal scholarship parts ways, right? This is why we see liberal scholars as Holocaust deniers. It's, it's the same thing. So, like, 
when somebody says like a Bart Ehrman, oh, well, we don't know who the author was and it was written a hundred years after he's making it up. He has no evidence, um, you know, and, and it's been shown that multiple times in conservative scholarship. But again, the two sides don't talk to each other. So there really are no when you're talking through conservative evangelical scholarship, there are no problems when you want to make other worldview assumptions this is the same thing i was talking about with making making assumptions about science is that you know whatever your worldview assumptions are will absolutely calculate the outcome of where you're going to get yeah but problem that the uh, chris the problem inherent in what you just said is that it, is it has to be true for the and not just for me right so if, if, if you're going to say something like that, then you have to be prepared to admit that the conservative scholars will have their what will have their uh, opinions tainted by their view world view as well. Uh, otherwise, you're special pleading. Well, no, but the, the difference is that conservative scholars take all scholarship into account, whereas liberal scholars will discount conservative scholarship. I'm because not conservative sure. scholars are forced know that. I'm not sure because how you can know I that read unless the you had, literature. Unless because, you had look, access to all of it, unless you had access to 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 all of the opinions, all the compiled inform, uh, opinions of all of the quote unquote liberal versus conservative scholars, I'm not sure how you could make such a such a broad sweeping assumption. Because you could read three articles and get that assumption. Because I mean, like the the, the whole thing is that written by we, conservatives, they, written by conservatives and liberals. And so when you read the scholarship of so so for instance perfect example. I'll send you an article in the back channel of, uh, of a um, interaction that Dr. Bowen had with a conservative scholar. And what it ended up being was what Dr. Bowen wanted was the conservative scholar to quote an atheist scholar to bolster the conservative scholar's position because Dr. Bowen was not going to count any conservative scholarship as any answer to his question. And so the, the, the assumption is built in. And so that is the problem with this type of scholarship. And that's what you get at the end of the day, is that you get Dr. Bowen having an exchange with a conservative scholar. The conservative scholar comes back and gives him a question. And Dr. Bowen is like, well, it's not worth my time because he's not going to come back with another atheist scholar that's going to bolster his position. So, so I mean, that's what I'm talking about here. Yeah, I, I understand that. But what, what I don't want this to, to do is devolve into... Because you know, like like the the hard part is is that you've got you know the person you're you're addressing directly is is in the audience but unable to defend themselves right now. I'm not qualified to to defend him. I I deny on the like just based on what I know about him. I deny your statement that he's just said this is not worth my time. I I just deny that. Um, but well, I don't you know, know what he said. He said that's true, but he literally just ignored the rest of the um, conservative scholars' questions, and that that's where the interaction ended. So you can see the entire history on Twitter. So, I mean, what I am saying, and again, look, Dr. Bowen seems like a fine person. What I'm saying is that this scholarship doesn't talk to each other for very good reasons. So, so are, but are you willing to concede that it is the same for thee as it is for me, that, that the conservative scholarship will also have their views tainted by their worldviews? Oh, absolutely. Uh, All so, human, no human is objective. Right. Well, it, yeah, and, and I mean, one of the things though, like you know, that would be that would just be a, a pretty, I think, common sense assumption, though. But, but I think rightfully so. Like, if we're talking about the dating of the Gospels, for example, all the all the Gospels, you know, were around the area where you know the destruction of the temple took place, and we we know when that happened. So, some of the Gospels, or the Epistles of Paul, something in the New Testament, surely, like this, could not be ignored. So right there, you would say, you know, you have your conservative meaning and conservative biblical bias. Yes, but, but this is founded on a good reason. For me, one of the very good reasons why, you know, we would date it much earlier is because if it happened, if these were written and compiled after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, then it certainly would have been mentioned somewhere in some of the New Testament writings. There's lots of books in the New Testament. Somewhere would have made a passing note. They made passing notes of much less. They made notes about the goings on of Rome and Paul's journey to Rome. So if, if this would have been compiled after Nero in the temple, then someone would have written it. So I think a good assumption, not just conservative bias, needing it to be early, because I mean, it doesn't matter if it was written in the 4th century. Um, if God is God, God is God. So I mean, you know, I'm not beholden to a certain timeline. I just think it's reasonable to think 
that if these were written after the temple destruction, it would have been noted somewhere. And the fact that none of the Gospels, none of the uh, you know other stuff in the New Testament has it anywhere, then it seems a really good indication that these were written before that date. Uh, whereas you know other people would say, well, I don't know what the reason for saying it's it's later is, other than you know kind of nefarious things. But I can't think of a good objective reason they would point to and say, here is a very good reason why this would have been written at a later date rather than before. Versus the destruction of the temple, I think is pretty objective that people can say, okay, that's a fair point. Uh, you know, that, that gets rid of a lot of bias. That's a rather unbiased point. That makes a lot of sense. Anyway, that's my humble position. Yeah, yeah, and and we're, we're outside of, like, we're so far outside of anything I can talk about with, with a degree of intelligence that it isn't even funny. But I, I guess, Chris, I would ask you, please, please don't forget to send me uh, the, uh, like, the, the link to that, but just, just so that I can, just so that I can, it to you. okay, okay. Just so that I can also ha have it w without having to go back and look at the message straight away. Who was the who was the the scholar that that uh, that Josh was interacting with w w during this exchange? Robert Clifton Robertson. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I'll I'll have a look. Thanks. Th thanks. I I appreciate it. And yeah, I, like I said, I'm I'm not I'm not trying to stir I'm not trying to stir stuff up. It's just yeah. Anyway, bias. Well, it's is just accepted. it's a different yeah. And I mean, it, look, biases are always baked in. However, there is a difference between conservative scholarship and liberal scholarship. One is looking for the truth. The other is looking to tear down what somebody else thinks is the truth. It, it, they, they bear no resemblance. So when we're talking about theological scholarship, one is looking for the truth. The other is looking to tear down what somebody else thinks is the truth. That's the difference. Sorry, I was just uh, I was <laughs> I'm I'm trying to multitask this morning. I've been I've been uh, I've been in the room kind of since its inception this morning, and uh, I've realized I've been neglectful on some of my household duties. So I was just in the process of uh, of uh, feeding a snake. So I apologize if I didn't answer right away. Yeah, uh, Moe, Matthias is mentioned in Scripture. It's Acts one twenty three, where it says, So they put forward two men, Joseph, Joseph and called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And then Acts 1 and 26, that says, And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. So, now. Checkmate, dude. Okay, now what? <laughs> Chris, Nate? Right. I mean, yeah, 100%. I mean, Moe doesn't have an argument. I mean, he didn't have an argument the first time we... Yeah. It's fun. I mean, it's just like, I mean, like, you know, going to, um, you know, whatever the blog is of the skeptic and trying to find some kind of nonsense that's a, that's an objection that has never been answered in 2000 years of Christian history. Like, seriously? Like, really? Um, so, Moe, yes, Judas was one of the 12 and then he killed himself. And then they replaced him with Matthias. You can read this in scripture. It's fact. It's not hard to understand. So what's interesting, I, I don't know who Moe is, but um, as a, just as a, a point, um, and I don't have a Bible in front of me um, right now, but my understanding is there's two separate accounts of how Judas died. One one hanging himself and one his gut spilling open or something like that, and I don't think both can be right, can they? Sure, yep. because he can hang himself and then his guts can spill out. 
Uh, I, I suppose if he hung if he hung there long enough and then his body rotted to a point where it would start. Oh. Ding 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 ding. So, but that's okay. So, but then you're asserting that that like over what period of over what period of time? I guess. And this and again, so far outside my area of expertise, of but a couple of days. Um, I don't I don't know whether that's a possibility given human anatomy and temperature and climate and stuff. I I just don't know whether that's feasible or not. People that study these things showed that it is. So there's physicians who have studied these things who showed absolutely that that is exactly what happened. Yeah, Same so thing with the spear piercing the pericardium, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things have been looked over by physicians, by forensic experts, looking at the text of the scripture to confirm these things. Yeah, and I wanted to say to Moe, um, I don't know if he doesn't understand that Paul wrote like eight, six, seven or eight books of the Bible, and he mentions the 12, I mean, pretty regularly. So if you want to give me a scripture, if you want to give me chapter and verse about what you're talking about, I'd be happy to go over that with you. I was on a phone call. I just got back. How's it going? We conquered world peace. Indeed. All right. Kumbaya. So Moe and Michael are at peace with our Lord and Savior now? Yes, they have both <laughs> converted to Christianity. Yeah, when, yeah but the, the, the hard part is, Nate, is that I'm a Calvinist like Chris. I mean, Calvinists are still saved. So, and you know, it's only the, log it's the only logical position, so that's where Michael would end up running anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're the unmarried bachelor of Christianity. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. For well, yeah, someone was saying, have you ever been in a room of top apologists? They can't agree on hardly anything. I guarantee I'm just going to, you know, speak, speak uh, on good faith. I guarantee uh, if you ask them about the gospel, they're probably going to get it all right and agree. And then you're going to ask them a question unrelated to salvation issues. And yeah, it probably is, as you say, they won't agree. But um, to say, you know, a bunch of top Christian apologists uh, can't agree on anything. The things they all believe they must agree on, they all believe they must agree on. The things they believe they can disagree on, they're going to disagree on. Yeah, and lest anyone take a clip from this uh, recording, no, I have not converted to Christianity. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to circulate that. Hey, um, Michael, um, hit me up in the back channel because I have an evil plan that I would like to execute with you. Oh, oh, I want involvement. Can I do I that? have this. So, Chris, as long as you're not talking about yes. me trying to do like a false conversion thing, because I have this terrible moral compass where I try to be honest. Yeah, it's not that. Oh, OK, sure. I, I'm, I'm up for almost anything. No, Mo, you're going to stay down there. We've already given you a chance and we've answered you like a thousand times in chat. And you're just obstinate. Like, this is the interpretation. This is the answer. Like it or don't. Deal with it. Get a new question. Ask it. Hey, yeah, Dr. Just... Bowen's here. What's up, Joshua? Hey, guys. Yeah, I um. So I guess uh, it'd be uh, it'd be interesting to sort of flesh this out a little bit. Um. Yeah, you're absolutely right with somebody like Robert Robinson. Uh you know, who, who writes long treatises and can't get it right. What I, I mean, it says that I'm a Yale professor or something repeatedly. Um, there's a certain point where somebody like him, you know, after you respond to him a number of times, uh, I mean, I think probably Chris, you take a similar pack as you did today with the, you know, the, the gentleman that was in here earlier. It's just like, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this. Um, and, you know, so certainly that, that sort of thing factors in. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, one, it is, so, so I was a fundamentalist evangelical Christian for 26 years. So I went to a very fundamentalist university for my bachelor's degree and then uh, one also for my master's in theology uh, to the point that, um, Todd Beale was uh, my Old Testament advisor. 
uh, you probably wouldn't find somebody that would be more conservative fundamentalist evangelical than he. Um, and, you know, so I, so I understand the positions uh, that you're describing, um, at least when it you know, comes to the, to the Hebrew Bible. Um, but I think, I think what I would say is that in my experience, what you're describing um, about, uh, you know, sort of the ETS crowd in genuine search of the truth, uh, whereas, you know, people that are uh, whatever, whatever liberal scholarship is being defined as or not, where they're just seeking to tear down what the former group, uh, if, if I heard you right, uh, is doing. It's just that hasn't been my experience. Um, so like at Hopkins, for example, uh, I, would, I would venture to say that 70 percent. Uh, of the faculty and students, grad students at the time, were religious people. Uh, I'd say most of them would identify as Christian in one form or another, uh, be a Protestant or Catholic. Uh, and like like we translated through Ezekiel in one semester. And uh, of course, my best friend going through was Caleb Howard. Um, you can look him up. He's, you know, went to Trinity out in Illinois. And, uh, you know, he works at a Tyndale. Uh, he's still an evangelical Christian. Um, same with Jay Caballero. He's, you know, down at University of Texas, Austin, getting ready to graduate with his PhD in a and &E law. Um, but there was never a time like that I can remember, uh, even when going through something like Ezekiel and you know, going through that passage in chapter 26, where it even it even came up, um, you know, this 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 debate uh, with anybody. And I mean, I, I, I would assume maybe I shouldn't, but I would assume that you would consider the folks at it at Hopkins to be part of liberal scholarship. Uh, it's just it's not really a thing. Um, this this that's why what we do it. At, uh, like in, that's like in my books uh, and at Digital Hammurabi, the stuff that we do, is sort of this counter apologetics thing, it's sort of novel, right? Because for the most part, uh, it's not really a thing. This is why somebody like Joel Baden, um, you know, I messaged him a couple months ago and said, "Hey, there's this video that came out. You'd be interested in coming on." And he said, "Josh, I'm just, I'm just not interested. I got other things to do. I'm just not interested in it." Um, so it's, it just hasn't been my experience that there's this, um, you know, strong desire or desire really at all on the whole for liberal scholars, again, whatever that means to, uh, you know, to disprove, uh, those that are quote unquote seeking truth in, uh, you know, more evangelical scholars. And I'll say this last thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet, but. You know, I also think it's problematic, and again, not part of my experience, that um, arguments at places like ETS uh, or you know, you know, these more conservative circles are not factored in. It's just, it's just not true. Um, so, I mean, if you read any of my books, uh, it's like that's the point, right? Is to engage with the, the, that scholarship. Uh, but more than that, I'm I'm part of an edited volume that's coming out um next month or so from Rutledge and it's specifically uh an edited volume dealing with problems with evangelical scholarship um like that's the point of the book so you know I that, like this idea that there's there's always this hand waving or there's always this we're not going to talk to them or deal with them that just hasn't been my experience in scholarship so uh, real quick, first, Josh, um, how's the uh, kids? I remember last time I talked to you were at a certain place. Everything good with that? Yeah, they uh, they came out of the ER on, oh gosh, Saturday, I think. It was one of those nights. They were there for two and a half so, days. But, uh, all's good now, though? Yeah, they're, they're probably at about 85, 90% um, still on the breathing treatments and everything. But, uh, 
you know, the oxygen levels are back up, which is, which is really great. Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, go ahead, Chris. So, so Josh, what you had had an, uh, an interaction with a friend of mine, um, Phil Denver. And, uh, what did you describe your motivation to Phil as? Uh, to ensure that, uh, people that, uh, adhere to and present um, generally in ways that seek to restrict the rights of others, uh, more fundamentalist views of the text, uh, that those be set of right. In, in terms of political power, correct? Um, I mean, I think there are other ways besides political power that people do that. No, but I don't sure. mean like other, I'm not talking about like, I'm talking about like you want to limit the political power of a specific group that you feel is hurting other groups by your scholarship to show them that the God that they believe in is untrue. Is that not the motivation you presented to Phil? No, uh, absolutely not. The last thing that you huh. said to show that their God is untrue. Well, that was the it was the implication of what no, you it absolutely I mean, it was, was not the implication, was, oh, and in really? fact, I corrected it. Yeah, so go ahead. Interesting. I mean, I, I'd have to, I'd have to go back and have real Phil read the text messages to us. Yeah, yeah. but and I, of course, I, mean, I didn't give him permission, by the way, to to put those public. But you know, no matter. Uh, of course, he yeah, came to me in a a good faith, which of course I had no idea that's what he was doing. Um, which again, I mean. But what please feel free to read them. Is, well, I mean, again, he didn't send them to me. He just kind of read them out loud. Well, ask me if, you, if, if you're if you interested. Go ahead. I'm here. I think he just got a phone call. So we can have a nice, peaceful conversation until he gets back. Um, yeah, if you're good to engage, I'll let you and Chris talk a little bit, and then I will have to run. But um, during uh, this time it's, of peace. It's, it's, it's okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm generally not up here trying to. I don't like people um, trying to ask me gotcha questions like that. That's, that's I don't respond well to that. I, I don't either. Um, unfortunately, that seems to be a lot of, well, that's pretty much everything we've gotten today. <laughs> and this uh, you is know, true. We, we deal this with it and we, answer, we, and, and we answer the gotcha questions. And when we, you know, uh, it's like when you give an inch, they take a mile. So even though we entertain the ridiculousness and we answer them, um, objectively, they got answers. They don't have to like them. They don't have to believe them. But we did answer. Um, so now they've been railing in chat for like the last what hour. And um, you know, I just I just mentioned I'm like hey, I just let you guys hear so everyone can kind of see you expose yourself. Like one of you should never claim to be a religion of peace at all. You maybe people in your religion are. You certainly are not. And the other one should never claim anything when they can't get vowels right. Um, anyways, so I'm just letting them do their thing in chat. So as long as they're not like swearing and stuff like that, go for it, guys. Uh, what were you saying, Josh? What? Yeah, I, I will say, I mean, so that it's clear, because I, I completely understand, because uh, I was in that stream, right, when Philip read those those chats out, and it kind of caught me by surprise that uh, that he that he read them. I mean, it was, you know, if he wants to do that, I guess, found it odd. But, Philip or Chris? Uh, no, Philip. Philip D Denver, is that his name? Um, what did he read? Maybe I was tuned out. Like, I, yeah, whenever. I mean, I don't, like, I, 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 I'm, cer I'm certainly not. Uh, uh, I certainly stand behind everything that I said, uh, but I can understand how somebody might um, pull that as an implication that if I am uh, concerned, for example, that. Uh, a particular interpretive framework, like a more fundamentalist evangelical interpretive framework, um, is being weaponized, uh, even inadvertently weaponized, um, to restrict the rights of others. And I, I'm going to work uh, hard with the scholarship that I have and the information that I have uh, to, um, you know, correct uh, those. Uh, I think faulty uh, conclusions from their interpretive framework, but but sorry, I was just going to say. Sorry, I know I'm rambling on a little bit, but I, the, the the thing that I would say though is it has nothing to do whatsoever with leading people away from their faith. 
I mean, I mentioned Caleb Howard and Jay Cavalier. They're very strong evangelical Christians. My wife is a Christian, right? There's there's no desire whatsoever uh, for me to to dissuade someone from their belief in God or that God is not true or something. I mean, it's certainly not my conviction that he's true, but I mean, it's 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 in many ways hardly relevant to me. Um, my concern is, that, for example, the one thing that I feel like I end up talking about all the time is uh, slavery in the Old Testament, right? In fact, I have a debate coming up on the 14th on the Myth Vision podcast that is about this. Kip Davis and I are doing a two-on-two debate. And, you know, when when people engage in what I can only call slavery apologetics, um, you, you end up with ideas that you, you end up hearing people say things like, you know, slavery's not so bad. And to me, um, yeah, I just, so, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, well I, I think Chris may be off the phone, but real quick, like, you know, when you say people who take kind of a fundamentalist, you know, whatever you said approach, like, I think you would definitely put me in that category. Like I, I definitely, I put myself in that category depending where you're going with it. Uh, but then you said, you, you seem to imply that, you know, even if they did do that, as long as they're not using it to, you know, harm others or for bad stuff in the world, um, you, the implication was even that would be fine to have their fundamentalist beliefs. Um, so I, I would be curious, like, because I'm definitely the audience, um, whether or not I'm, you would consider me trying to force stuff on other people, um, I, I would be wondering. So like outright, um, you would kind of try to impede or dissuade their faith at the expense of what you see as kind of unjustly pushing their fundamentalist beliefs on people to harm in that very specific scenario then see, if it came down to it you may kind of try to steer them away from their faith is that correct no, no see that's no, see that's the thing like and again i understand the confusion it might so let me give you a good example uh you know most of my family remains fundamentalist evangelical and my mother um comes over to our house to see our kids um which is great, right? Um, and but but my mother's not like she's very very respectful, uh, and she she'll say things like, "Listen, I I'm concerned about the kids. I I think they're going to hell. Do you mind if I present the gospel to them?" Yeah, go ahead. I mean, like they, they know it already, right? Um, but please, you know, because I I think critical thinking is a very important thing. Um, but, but my goal has never, ever been for my mother to stop believing in God or to lose her faith. My only concern uh, is that she adopt what I consider to be um, a, a better interpretive framework, right? Uh, so, in other you know, words, more all, like a um, more like a uh, like nineteenth century literary criticism, Presbyterian light kind of view, Nadia Bolt Weber kind of view kind of thing? No. Um, no, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think, I don't think you'll find me arguing for much that is 19th century. Um, uh, I suspect that uh, you, you may have a mis, maybe slightly misguided on what that, what, what modern scholarship entails, but um yeah sure. so 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 well, could you, you know, could, yeah well, sorry Josh, sorry to cut you off but could, could you give me like a, a what if like instead of you know a position that a a guy with a phd has their their whole thing like just a couple issues that you would see problematic that you would want to steer someone into a more amicable interpretation of i think you mentioned slave apologetics or something like yeah, that so yeah. what would be like a biblical interpretation that me as very much someone who would identify as probably a fundamentalist would have um to see if that's right i mean i guess i would be a slave apologist um yeah, yeah I mean, so what yeah so I, I think it's a good example right yeah that that's a good example so like um passages like exodus 21 20 to 21 and leviticus 25 44 to 46 right these these passages come up a lot and, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I see it quite a bit. Like atheists will, will throw these out in such a way that I think they're going a little overboard um, in, in what they're saying. So, for example, something like Exodus 21, 20, 20, this is a manual on how to beat your slave within an inch of their life and get away with it. Right. That's nonsense. Uh, that's, 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 that's not what the text is doing. 
Um, so like, you'll see me correct that from on the atheist side, right? But the, the, the other side of this though, um, and I think just as dangerous, maybe more so. People who say that that's not real slavery. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's, it's like, well, what ends up happening is there becomes this defense of often like the legal rationale. So the thing that you hear all the time is like, well, how else would they motivate their slave? Right? Uh, the master has to have a way to motivate their slave and they couldn't beat him to death, right? You couldn't abuse them. It was just moderate correction. Well, the thing that people don't realize is if you go back and read the laws of the antebellum South, it's the same legal rationale. Instead of taking right? like a, instead of taking like a, a hot button issue like slavery, why don't you break it down to a better issue that we deal with in, in everyday regular life, and something that has political ramifications with which you're interested? No one's really relitigating slavery anymore. So why don't you well, give well, us a better example? Well, yeah, I, I mean, to, to talk to that one just a second, and I, I will, since you're back, Chris, I, I did say I'd listen while you guys talked. I'm a bad listener. Um, anyways, but just my final point on this, even if someone like, you know, my radical fundamentalist backwoods interpretation, uh, you know, of this would be, first of all, what about someone in this group like me who says, well, if you're not an Israelite, these are never your laws. So these do not apply to you. You can, whatever, there's never your law. So you're never going to be faced with a time where you have to beat a slave within an inch of their life. This was never for you. You are not these people. That's a literal fundamentalist, like as close to the people that live their time. If I would have went to, you know, Jewish people of the time and be like, hey, I have a slave. What does your law say about beat them? I'd be like, well, our law tells us, but our law is not applicable to you. You're not one of us to go do whatever you want. I'm going to be like, oh, OK. Um, and then I would say, furthermore, this is a lot more complex than beat a slave within their inch of their life. You'd have to read it how the people who came up whose law this is do. And that's in the Talmud. So when people try to take two verses in the Bible that are bullet points and say, oh, beat them within an inch of life and live, and this may be where we're getting to apologetic territory, but I would say it's inaccurate territory. You would need to read like, you know, the half a book in the Talmud Encyclopedia that explains all the ins and outs of this law. Uh, and it's not to excuse it, it's say no one knows what that says. I, I've read enough to know that you need to go to the Talmud to consult it. And I guarantee most of the people arguing that, you know, slavery apologetics have no idea what the actual law says so it would behoove everyone to be accurate go read the talmud call a rabbi um so that would be my fundamentalist interpretation and then i would say yeah if if the the only time that would apply and if there's some dumb christian that doesn't know this stuff that they're like um you know some ignorant christian that doesn't know this stuff then i i politely would educate them all the time if they're like look the law says this and exodus i'm like it's not your law you're a gentile it's not your law it's never for you um I would, I would try to educate, but I would say the only time these passages, the Levitical law of slavery is going to matter is if the Jewish people get their temple built, rebuilt, and they begin enforcing their laws again, that would be a time where these would be applicable. And the audience you would need to take that argument to are the Jewish people because they're the only ones these laws are being enforced by, presumably. Well, I mean, so that, that's it, it what I would law. say. How would you respond to that? No, I mean, those are laws for the nation of Israel, but there's also some rules for like, aliens living among them right i mean like in the yeah we talked about that earlier but exactly. I, I wanted to get josh's I mean. response real fast but again like what does slavery have to do with the price of tea like you know like i'm saying joshua right up... yeah okay well i just want a better example i think josh was dying <laughs> I, yeah i know i want i want you to uh, yeah i want i want chris and josh to speak um and yeah i just wanted sorry. to follow that up sorry i'm i'm dodging answering the question that he asked me about slavery it's interesting no uh, all right, I'll bow out. You and Chris talk. <laughs> not the question about slavery. You were the one who brought up slavery to generate a whole bunch of other questions instead of dealing with something that is applicable today in terms of what is something that you would want to convince your mother about that is a better interpretation of Christianity. Yeah, so I mean, I'm guessing you just forgot what Nate asked me, but that's okay. Um, so... I mean, I think if you're looking for something um, that would be uh, more applicable, perhaps to people in this room, uh, unfortunately, I hear about slavery all the time uh, in these in these circles. So, it, I mean, it is very applicable uh, to the circles that uh, I go into around here. So, 
Um, but I have a chapter, for example, in volume two of the Atheist Handbook that talks about uh, comparing uh, the laws of the ancient Near East uh, to the laws in the Hebrew Bible concerning rape and adultery, right? Um, and that's a very difficult, it's a difficult chapter to write. It's probably a difficult chapter to read. Uh, but one of the things that I hear, again, quite often, uh, is that, you know, the, the biblical text, in particular, my area of specialization, the Hebrew Bible, uh, are, are so much more progressive, they're so much more advanced uh, than, than what we see uh, in the wider ancient Near East. In certain areas, uh, sure, right? Yeah, I mean, there are there are places in the, in the legal collections um, in certain laws that are more progressive in something like Hammurabi uh, than in the Hebrew Bible, and there are places in the Hebrew Bible that are more progressive than uh, you know what we see in in Hammurabi or Eshenun or Lipidishtar or whatever. Uh, but on the whole, I mean, like this is this is one of the things that Near Eastern scholars have sort of predicated. Uh, things on foundationally speaking is that they're they're roughly on par right now there are some sort of supernatural uh, aspects like Deuteronomy 15 Leviticus 25 where it's um, you know the, the stipulations are in place with the promise of divine supernatural blessing um, but these are you know more utopian ideas but but on the whole places like the covenant code uh, you know the, the, they're just they're what you would expect. Um, and so a place that I saw something incredibly dangerous is, uh, and, and he's a scholar that I, I really respect a lot of his work, that's Daniel Block. Uh, Daniel Block has a, an amazing two-volume commentary on the book of Ezekiel, uh, and I utilize it quite a bit. Um, and it's in the Nicot series, right? So it's, it's an evangelical. Uh, and I think he did some phenomenal work. Um, but he has a, a, an excursus on chapter 16. And in the excursus, um, his, his, the way that he defends the metaphor um, of Yahweh as the husband uh, punishing his wayward wife is incredibly problematic. Um, and so, you know, I... Like it's 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 very violent, right? Uh, and this is this is sort of just what was what was on par at the time, right? Uh, but I think I, certainly I did over twenty six years became sort of desensitized to that sort of thing, right? And uh, and so talking about things like the value of women um, or violence that is sort of inherent against women is something that people often just don't see in the text. Uh, and so, so that's- um, Wait a minute, so you're suggesting that Daniel Block is advocating violence against women? No, is not directly. No, and oh, did I ever say that? Directly? Yeah, I mean, I think- Again, Josh, you play, you play games, we'll play your games, but here's the game that you're playing, is that you're trying to impugn Daniel Block as someone who is encouraging violence against women because he's writing mm, nope. in a commentary on Ezekiel. No, you're not? Okay. No. Well, so then what what is the problem? What is problematic? You said it is problematic the way in which Daniel Locke is talking about the relationship between Yahweh and the wayward wife of Israel encouraging violence. What is mm -hmm. problematic? What is problematic with that? Um, well, yes. are you, you can go, you know, let me answer. Or are you just going to keep talking? I, I was going to finish my question, but go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I hope that you would think, uh, that direct calls for violence or direct calls uh, for any action are not the only way, uh, that such ideas can be propagated, right? Well, uh, I, would, I would think you would give us think three other ways. That. Oh, Israel, Concrete. you're like my wife, and I gave you so many opportunities, and I'm a patient husband. But if you don't no, 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 me, I want. I just want in general. Okay. I just want in general how there are other ways to call for violence. Is that directly calling for violence? Are you are that's, you saying like words that's, or violence? Are, am I performing violence on you right now, Josh? 
I don't even understand that question. So, exactly. if well, I mean, the answer was right. What Mister just said was the answer. And sorry, I can't keep my mouth shut. I tried. Um, well, what Mister said it was like a metaphor. It's like, oh, Israel, how you know, like whatever, a bad wife, and it's a metaphor. And they're saying metaphorically or subliminally, they're not saying that, but subconsciously, that's normalizing violence against women, even though it's talking about the creator of the universe and that's an true. entire na- an entire nation. Somehow, people are hearing that in their minds and it's desensitizing them. Which my only point would be above that. And I'd say if this is one of the biggest problems uh, you have with Christianity um, in 2023 now, my first thing would be um, you're not going to find almost any normal Christian you ask is not going to have any idea what you're talking about. Um, so that's a non-issue. They just don't read their Bible that deeply, which is unfortunate. Um, the second thing is if that's the biggest problem we have with Christianity in 2023, man, you should just convert right now and just be done with it. Like this is not – I understand if someone really got that message – but first of all, the chances of Christians actually getting that message, your normal Christian is not going to get that. They're not going to have any idea about it. They're like, what are you talking about? And you'll have to point to the chapter and verse for them. And uh, I, I would say I, well, well, I would say definitely there was, should be bigger bones to pick with other religions. Not saying this excuses Christianity. It's our God, right? But I'd say if that's the thing we're, we're picking, it's like a speck in the eye. My God, we talked to you know a person from you know the religion of peace the other day who was saying they're about to marry someone, and they said, what's wrong with marrying a nine-year-old child? Um, so I would, I would say, you know, yes. there are definitely actual issues way more that I would pick on before we talk about a metaphor from thousands of years ago. Uh, that's my thought. Yeah, I mean, so I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the example that you gave right at the end is, like, horribly atrocious, right? Um, yeah, this is Islam and what you see in the CE realm is certainly even vastly outside of my area of expertise. So uh, I'm, I'm doing what I can do, right? Uh, and that is dealing with the text that I specialized in. Um, and I think actually, I mean, I, I would imagine, Chris, that you haven't read any of my books, and that's okay. But no, actually, before so I you... Bought, I bought your books. I haven't read them yet, but I did buy them because I knew I was going to have an interaction with you at some point. So what I'm going to do, my offer to you, and again, I'm not a scholar, so I'm a layman. Um, I've read widely and deeply in a lot of issues, certainly not as deeply into Near East, um, you know, archaeology or Near East uh, literature as you have, obviously. I don't speak the languages, etc. So I'm not going to engage you on your area of specialty because that would be the height of foolishness right so like you know i would leave that to a conservative scholar to do so um you know and and i know quite a few conservative scholars so maybe i can set one of those up for you if you would be interested uh yeah that's fine um but i guess uh, the reason that i brought up the books is i think you will probably be i hope that you will be surprised at the tone that I take, uh, because it's a genuine tone. Uh, I mean, I feel like I've been a little riled up here today. I don't like being attacked, but, um, but the reality here, like in the, in the chapter on the Exodus, for example, um, you know, the, the chapter is Exodus history or myth, right? Um, and I think the way that a lot of people assumed that I was going to come at that was to say, uh, you know, like only a, only a moron would think that the uh, like th- th- there's any historical validity to any aspect of the Exodus or something, right? Well, I mean, like that's silly. Uh, I mean, we have uh, early attestation, I think, to at least some sort of an Exodus tradition, maybe going back to the 11th century. I mean, that's probably a little generous, but I mean, that's that's possible, and certainly the early prophets. Uh, you know. Uh, speak to it. But the, the, the main point uh, of both the introduction and the conclusion... I love liberal scholarship being generous. That's so fantastic. Um, sorry, I'm just speaking from the data. Um, no, you're not, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Peace, so you... people. Deep breaths. That's, that's, that's okay. I, I got about uh, five or ten minutes. Yeah, that's, that's sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll jump off here. But, no, no, you're uh, good. The five or yeah. ten minutes is for you and Chris. Yeah. No, and maybe it's, Mr. It's, it's every now okay. and then. Uh, no, no, I'll, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I'll just, I'll say this. Uh, the, like, the way that I frame the Exodus is that the historicity of it, like, whether two and a half million people 
walked out of Egypt in the 15th century or the 13th century or whichever century uh, one adheres to, it's it's not. I don't I don't think it's really all that important ultimately to the validity of Christianity, right? Uh, like I think what the story does, and I do think that it's probably built on at least a kernel. Uh, of 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 historical truth, right, uh, or historical validity, um, but 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 it's it's that's not really the point, right? The the point of the text is is what it did for the for the faith tradition, and what those that adhered to you know the the the, the origin story of the nation, what they did with it, right? And and so, in other words, I don't think that there's any defeater if we're using that philosophical term, like I don't think there's any defeater in anything that I've ever written or suspect or will write for like faith or something or, or Christianity. That's not the point, right? Uh, again, my wife is a Christian. Like there's never, ever been a conversation where it's like, hey, sweetie, you shouldn't be a Christian. And there's never been a conversation where she said, Josh, you shouldn't be an atheist. Changing the terms, man. Again, this is this is what I dislike, okay, is that you're changing the terms. You're attempting to be super affable. You're talking about Christianity in the abstract. Let me ask you a question. Is there a path to Christianity without a physical, literal resurrection of Jesus Christ? Are you asking if people can be Christians without a physical resurrection? Yes. They obviously are. Right. And so there is our disconnect. Is that Yeah, of course. I mean, you, you have an interpretive model that you think is correct. Wow, no, no, I, I don't. Um, so, so here's the thing, is that... You don't have an interpretive model that you think is correct? Well, of course I have. I have oh, okay. Model. It's the literal, historical, grammatical method of reading scripture, just like the prophets did. That's a whole different topic. My, my point being that uh, when you take something like the resurrection of Christ and you reduce it down, a la von Harnock, right, um, to the universal brotherhood of man and the universal fatherhood of God, that is no longer Christianity. In that your opinion, agnostic. it doesn't matter. My opinion, that's what the scripture says. That is the definer of Christianity. Paul and now you're changing the terms. 15. No, 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 no. Paul, you said Paul that my it. goal was to get people to leave their faith and to say that God is right. not true. Right? Right. And that, Do you want to backtrack on that? No, I don't want to backtrack on that because I think that is your position. Um, because what, you, what I mean Demonstrably again, not. talking back to each other, obviously it is. Because what we're doing is you are defining faith in a certain way that can be a faith without a literal resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. I am defining faith as something different. I am defining well, then maybe you need faith. to change your terms when you come at me. Well, but no, maybe you need to go with the terms that have been the terms for Christianity for the last 2,000 years instead of doing, again, the 19th century thing and changing all the word meanings and going with this postmodern scholarship nonsense. Well, then so maybe ask me the question is, instead of saying what I'm doing, right? If you if you I think that I'm using a different, well, then then, then backtrack and say, okay, so you're not doing no, that no, according to what you said. What you are doing is exactly what I said you were doing in the beginning. You are trying to lead people away from a faith that is in the from your very narrow faith. conception of what faith is. Yes. Can I yes. can I take a stab? That is what you are trying to. Can I can I take a stab at this? So. Like, surely, Josh, from not religious person, you would have to agree that, you know, while, you know, interpretation of Christianity is subjective and everyone has their own, th there would definitely be, I mean, Michael, like I could ask Michael right now and he may, but he's going to get like the, the overwhelming consensus of Christian, no matter what flavor of Christianity, are going to say something like the death, burial, resurrection, uh, you must be born again, Jesus is the only way to inherit eternal life, right? And Paul in the Bible, believe it or, I mean, believe it or not, it, it is in there in print says, if the resurrection of Christ didn't happen, we're to be pitied because everything is lost and it's all lies. So there would be some things that even though Chris and myself, whatever Christians interpret, there are some things that are non-negotiable. So um, in that light, can you at least come that far as to be like, yes, there are tenets of Christianity. If I said I'm a Christian, yet I'm also a God, and you know Jesus was just a cool guy, um, but he didn't resurrect, and uh, you know I, I also am a Jainist and I worship Satan. You would say, okay, well, you can call yourself a Christian, 
but you, you basically like went against every tenant Christianity would have. Yeah, right. right? You're not so following like, what would be considered like a like a standard definition of what a Christian might be. Yes. Right. So like when well, yeah. So like when Chris was you know giving what you said was interpretation. I mean, certainly he has his own nuance, but there there are some non negotiables like the resurrection per the Bible. So like when you said your wife is a Christian, and what he I believe was trying to ask is you know like a Christian like the first kind. Like that, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I go to church. Uh, that's what makes me a Christian. And, you know, I don't really know if I'm God or we're all God or God is trees um, or the kind of Christian that would say something like you said, you know, you've never had a conversation trying to deconvert her and she's never had a conversation trying to convert you, right. which which seems odd that if she was the, you know, the, the Bible kind of Christian, she at least I would think would say something like, you know, I'm a Christian. And you know, I believe this is true. And, you know, I am concerned for you. Maybe you'd like to give it some thought sometime. So would she be like the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, like kind, yeah. or the I am God, we're all gods, I go to church sometimes well, kind? I mean, I don't, I don't think she would say anything about we're all gods, but... Uh, well, you know what I mean, so kind of like could, the biblical yeah. a hearing or not really. I mean, if if you want to if you wanna step away from the example of my wife, because I, I will grant you that, that, that she, I don't think that she would say that the resurrection, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a necessity for her to be a Christian. Um. But if you want to step to uh, other evangelical scholars that, uh, for example, I, I brought up Caleb Howard before I brought up my wife. I brought up Jay Caballero before I brought up my wife. Like, I can, I can promise you that neither uh, Caleb nor Jay uh, would be fundamentalist evangelicals, right? They're evangelicals. They're, they're right, but again, more conservative. Weaseling terms again. So, like... I, I'm just being specific with my terms. If you want to call that weaseling, go for it. Yeah, you're, you're, you're weaseling. So, so here's the here's the thing: okay. is that when we talk about evangelical, we mean a certain thing. Again, this is where postmodernism comes into it. Like words can mean whatever. You hey guys, I'm sorry. I got. Um, oh, oh, Nate. Uh, <laughs> Nate, Nate gave me my one wish life. Um, <laughs> But Chris, I have to pass the badge to you because I. Oh have to my, play. Mark! Mark did this. <laughs> my, I think Mark. I think Mark accidentally hit the thing that said "Let's talk," and I clicked yes. And I thought, I wonder if Chris was next in line. And I thought, oh boy, Michael got his badge. But then I guess the room canceled. It, it kicked me right back here, anyways. Anyways, I do have to go. But Michael, yeah, you're I gotta go as well, so I Yeah, I gotta so, go. So. Yeah. You, you guys better screenshot that, Michael. You got your day. Oh, I, I have many screenshots already. <laughs> All right, guys. Good, good talk, uh, thank Joshua. Thanks, thanks thank you for me. thank you for playing along. And Chris, everyone, take care. Michael Keegan, good to see you all. Bye. Uh, Mark, did you did you mean to chat? If you want to, just send me another message. Oh, guess you didn't. All right, take care, everyone.